We are just getting started. Sorry for a few minute delay. Um, are we good? Okay. All right. Welcome to today's city council meeting. We continue to host hybrid meetings to keep everyone healthy and safe. Our meetings are public and you are welcome to join in person or by watching the council's agenda page, Facebook, YouTube, or SLC TV. We hope you'll continue to join in whichever manner you feel most comfortable. This is a work session meeting during which there is no public comment, but please join us tonight during our 7 p.m. formal meeting to share your comments. We, of course, always welcome your feedback anytime by mailing us at P.O. Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah 84114, or emailing council.comments at slcgov.com, or via our 24-hour phone comment line at 801 Five three five seven six five four. The written comments that we receive on anything that is related to an agenda topic is shared with all council members and posted on our website, slccouncil.com. And now we will begin our work session. And our first item, as usual, is updates from the administration. And I understand that today we have Lise, Lindsay, Ava, I have a lot of people listed that are not here, so I don't know who's here. <laughs> um, and Ann, I think Andrew might be. Andrew online. Thank you very much. I think you guys have our slides. I'll just wait for those to come up and we can hop into the first slide when you're ready, Scott. Just a quick update on COVID, which is that across the US, Cases are down 15% over the last two weeks, but in Utah, they are up 17% in the last two weeks. So on the next slide, we continue to provide that information on where people are able to get their vaccination, which should be free to anyone who wants to seek it out. But if you haven't done so yet, it might be a good time to check and see if you are eligible for a booster. Um, and we'll move on to the next slide, and Ava is here to talk about community engagement. Thanks so much, Lindsay, and thank you to all the council members. Saludos a todos que están escuchando. Um, our, counts, our community engagement highlights, of course, everyone can always leave feedback for us. If you go to slc.gov forward slash feedback, you're able to get our engagement newsletters as well as regular updates. If we could go to the next slide, please. We have our updates from sustainability. We've just announced our resident food equity advisors program. You can go to slc.gov forward slash sustainability forward slash food hyphen equity hyphen grant. Um, but if you look this up, you're able to apply and this is a great uh, program to be able to take advantage of um, trying to combat food deserts here in Salt Lake City, as well as applying for a food equity micro grant. Public Utilities Update, also they have uh, the Big Cottonwood Treatment Plant rebuilding. They're in the early stages of development. That's gonna include a lot of public engagement and an advisory committee. Next slide, please. We've announced our monthly community office hours. This is where community members can come and talk to our community engagement team. So this is our outreach. I myself am one of the liaisons that you can speak to. We have a whole uh, uh, team of us that will be at these different locations here all throughout the month of February. We'd love to see you. We also have different liaisons that can speak in different languages. We'd love to communicate with you. Um, if you have any questions, any ideas or concerns, please take advantage of this. This is a great way that we get into the community, into different spaces and try to mobilize your ideas here with our, with our office. Next slide, please. Andrew. Hello, Council. Uh, as you can see on the slides, uh, the resource centers are still operating at a uh, very high uh, percentage of occupancy um, on average. Uh, it's actually probably gone up slightly since a few weeks ago when we talked, and you can see the average number of beds open per night. Uh, again, oftentimes um, what happens is beds can be reserved. Some of them can be reserved for the daytime for folks who plan on coming back to a resource center, but come that night they may or may not show up. So you'll see that these numbers actually reflect what happens first thing in the morning when they do the final count of that night, not necessarily the reservations and everything that was included the previous night. So again, very high use uh, so far. We continue to talk to everybody about other options and um, we've had a few things come up recently uh, with the county rec center obviously you're aware of during the really cold spill we had um, and then the second and second coalition as well has done some things with movie night 
Uh, so we're still always pursuing other options for everybody. Next uh, slide. Andrew? Yes. Um, th so at the bottom of that slide, it says it does not include the additional capacity. So when I'm looking at all these at 96, 95, yes. does that mean we haven't even even touched the additional capacity yet because we haven't even filled the yeah so staffing issue or um, all of the providers currently are short on staffing okay. i think mill creek is probably the closest to full staffing and they've run about 113 of the 120 beds on average so the 120 is their max if you looked at uh the geraldine and king for instance the women's resource center uh, they have a total capacity all in of up to 275 they haven't been able to go past about 230 because of staffing issues so okay. this would reflect the 230 amount not that 275. Thank you. So then is the Mill Creek 87.6% is is it impossible to get to 100% because is are is it the difference in the staffing there or not impossible I think they could probably come pretty close I think the staffing is not necessarily static either um, okay. they could be fully staffed for one week and then they lose somebody or call it sick those okay. kind of issues so So but we're using the Mill Creek as much as possible? Yes. Cuz I I'd, I'd be interested in a if uh, this would probably be something that's longer than just here mm -hmm. in a comparison of our rates from last year's emergency shelter and this year's because it does seem like we've maybe solved the transit issue and opened up the possibility that other places hosting the emergency shelter doesn't lead to decreased usage i would hate to go into the realm of mission accomplished with trans transportation um because <laughs> understood got it <laughs> with you <laughs> I, I think the providers have done a great job of figuring out the kinks and figuring out on a daily basis how to get to and from the mill creek facility um and multiple times this is all on going all night every night um but i would hesitate to say it's been completely fixed we've i'll say that the way effectiveness of these yes we've improved given, given a yeah. strong transportation strategy i say dramatically yes okay yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you thank you thank you andrew i think i think these numbers give us a, a good like perspective of what's happening um, in in a way like so you know the city's tasked with land use ordinances and 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 we do other things additional to that like sometimes we, we help financial with for the, with the service providers we um, do conditional uses we do the temporary so I feel like the city like we are doing our part and now. And then when we fought a lot for additional funding and for um, more beds and, and all of the things. And now that I feel like we've done this and now what we're missing, so now the gap is, okay, staffing. So we got all the things that we kind of had to go over um, politically and also ourselves. Like we, we've done that. Now the gap is, okay, we have everything, but we still cannot get the, you know, the staffing. So. Um, for the public, I want you to to know that um, if you still you know see issues out there and outside, it's not because we're here resting and hoping that this issue will be solved by itself. We're doing everything we can, and some some forces out there are beyond our control, like staffing. So um, um, you know, I, I want to encourage the public to keep talking about these issues, to keep talking to the legislature, I mean, they're in the session right now, to keep getting informed and to keep um, pushing for change, whatever it is to, um, that we all need to do so that we have enough staff, that they're paid correctly, that we have enough space, that we have the right funding, that so we can all do our, our work, but we need also the help of the public to, um, to push for change and to push for additional services and, and help. So um, thank you, Andrew, for the information. I guess I just wanted to say that I feel like we do everything we can until we cannot get there. So there are other things that are beyond our control. But we're, we're, we're keep trying. I think, Council Member, you're correct. There, there's a lot of um, talk right now at the state legislature during the session, and there are several bills that will be coming out regarding these specific needs. And so you're correct to um, encourage folks to pay attention, to participate, to advocate. I think from the city, and you're also correct that when you look at all of the um, the steps in this process from our emergency outreach and funding VOA, the outreach teams, um, the emergency shelter, and doing what we can to increase capacity or the allowance to do so, um, I think the mayor and you all have also been pretty ad, um, vocal in trying to get the word out that our pri private 
uh, nonprofits and providers are looking for staff and that there are available options there to sort of broadcast that, which is very helpful. So I appreciate that from the council and the mayor. Um, and then also from the city end, we continue to fund uh, deeply affordable housing. And you all al allocated a sneaking out amount of money a few months ago, six million, towards some projects that are currently being worked on uh, for this coming spring and summer. Um, so from the city end, a lot of work is being done on all those levels uh, because it's just not one thing that'll solve it. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, we have one more slide, if that would be helpful, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, the homeless engagement response team is tracking 43 locations currently throughout the city. And you can see that there's uh, active outreach or other plans for 36 of those. Um, it means on a rolling basis, we'll try and address everything as they come forward. And then there is some work to, to be done this coming week at Second South um, out towards Redwood Road. And then you also see the number of VOA engagement sites, uh, rehabilitations, and recurring cleaning. And that's all. Thank you, Andrew. Anything else from the administration? Thank you so much for your update. Appreciate that as always. Our next agenda item is item number two, an F equity update. And I think we get to meet the new chief equity officer today, Damian Choi, um, as well as Michelle Mooney, the equity manager for the mayor's office. Hello, good to meet you. Hello. Hello, may I grab some water first? Please do. I don't know if this is already part of your um, your presentation, but please introduce yourself to us. We're, I think it's our first time getting to interact with you in a meeting. Yeah, um, my name is Damien Choi. I'm the new uh, Chief Equity Officer. Um, I've been with the city in previous capacities as the Compliance Division Director and at Youth and Family as one of the Associate Directors. So thank you for allowing me to be in this space. I'm excited to work with you all. Thank you. And my name is Michelle Mooney. I'm the new equity manager. So I oversee the Human Rights Commission and the Racial Equity and Policing Commission. And I'm here to provide an, an, my annual report for both of those commissions. Wonderful. Excuse me, Michelle, could you just pull the microphone a little closer? Hold it closer. Thank you. Hold it closer. I know. I'm trying not to, I have a loud voice, I'm trying not to yell in the mic. <laughs> I'm like, okay, did you all have the slides for the HRC and REP update? Okay, so last year we were able to complete and <clears throat> complete the following, working with the mayor and city council to adopt and codify CEDAW, partner with internal stakeholders to conduct thriving in place study, review and adopting language access policy and joint resolution, and updating and relaunching the commission website. And this is just a short list. Um, I outlined it specifically in the annual report that I sent over to you all. Um, some of the 2023 goals that we have is building the framework for the intersectional gender equity analysis and developing a CEDAW task force, participation in the Salt Lake Valley Commission to End Homelessness, addressing geographic inequity, and evaluating thriving in place study and providing recommendations, creating procedure for consistent data collection of ethnic slash racial demographics to align with the federal census guidelines and establishing a, ch a children slash youth advocacy subcommittee. Next slide, please. And for the racial inequity and policing commission, some of the things we worked to complete in the last year, we worked with SLCB PD to complete more than 75% of phase one recommendations. That leaves six items in progress and two still yet to be completed. We were able to work to hire the senior education advisor for the mayor's office to renegotiate the MOU for the school resource officers, hire a full-time recruiter and community outreach officer for SLCPD, recommend the final Salt Lake City community-based trainers of color to conduct DEI training for SLCPD, which should be executed this fall, increase staffing for co-response team, as well as updating and relaunching the commission website. Some of our 2023 goals are to partner with the ADC to facilitate a neurodiversity and sens slash sensory needs subcommittee, 
review the current structure of the Civilian Review Board and evaluating national models, coordinating community listening sessions led by the REP commissioners, and recommending a budgetary allotment for mental health professionals and victim advocates. This specific budget um, will be approximately $20,000 from the REP budget into the SOCPD budget if approved in order to provide culturally responsive therapy to victims of families who have experienced negative police interactions. And that completes my update. Thank you. Is there anything else from the equity update or are we moving on to the accessibility and the Mr. public Chair? accommodation? Yes. May I ask a question? Please do. Thank you. Um, well, welcome, both of you. It's exciting. Um, with that last uh, goal for 2023 with the victim advocates and having some amount of funding allotted to the SLCPD, that would be specific to families that have um, had negative police interaction, right? Because we do fund other victim advocates and, and I recognize where they're at, but I think for this particular a monetary amount or whatever it is that that it be specific to what we're trying to get at so is that part of is that written out like that <laughs> yes um so ashley cleveland in our office has came to present it is she here? Oh. <laughs> oh hey yes she came to present with wendy isom and it's going to specifically go to increase those therapies cultural responsive therapy for the families that are affected okay yeah specifically for that well that's awesome i have a like, question on that. on that yeah i also think that's great um wonder what why the decision to house that budget in the police department budget was made rather than in non-departmental or some other budget that's a great question <laughs> um i guess for that yeah if you want to Hi, uh, can you please repeat the question? Uh, so it sounds like from what we're what we're hearing, we're um, there's there potentially will be a funding request to increase uh, to provide counseling or some sort of uh, support for individuals who may have had a negative police interaction. I'm just wondering about whether that makes the most sense to have that budget housed in the police department budget or if it makes sense for that to be separated kind of like we've done with body cameras and other things okay. um i think it would probably make the best sense and the best use of our victims advocates time to be housed there because most of their referral process and policies come from that pipeline of action from the police department so they're closest to the need yes okay appreciate that Okay, any other questions on, on for this equity update? No, no question, uh, Chair, but just uh, thank you for the work. I appreciate all the, the effort we've gone on. I mean, we started the REP a few years ago, and uh, it's been ongoing and getting better every day, and I really appreciate the engagement across the city and the city uh, admin and the council across the board. So I appreciate the, all the effort, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you're doing for the city. All right, so we are a little ahead of time moving to item number three, which is somewhat related. We have Ashley Lichty, the city's ADA coordinator, here to talk about com public accommodation and closed captioning. And just council members, as we, uh, we may have some of the accessibility and disability commissioners here with us today, and they may be communicating to us through the ASL interpreters. And if so, just make sure to give some space after your comments for, for that to happen. Hi, council. Thank you for having me today. Um, as was just mentioned, I am Ashley Lickley, the ADA coordinator. I also am the board manager for the Accessibility and Disability Commission. About a year ago, I sat in front of you actually with an ordinance to codify the commission. And now I am very honored to get to be here um, pushing forth their first formal recommendation. Um, which is the closed captioning ordinance. And uh, this ordinance is a learning opportunity for the community as a whole. Um, it would require 
all places of public accommodation who have TVs that are on. And um, newer than 1990 to have their closed captioning on. Um, this way, a whole array, array of uh, visitors and residents would um, have more inclusion to uh, TVs in public accommodations, whether that is uh, waiting for a doctor's appointment in a lobby or at a bar or restaurant watching a sports game. It gives more inclusion across the board. Um, and this is already, this is something that has been happening across the country since 2008. Um, there have been, uh, since then, a lot of uh, kind of trial and error situations that the FCC has helped to mitigate and regulate so um, business owners can um, edit, or not edit, but customize their captions, and uh, the FCC kind of really takes into consideration any sort of um, concerns with captions that folks have. Um, and so I just want to open this up for questions, and um, also just want to say thank you so much for uh, letting me be here today. Thank you, Ashley. So just to clarify, this is a proposed city ordinance yes. that would require not just city facilities, but private businesses that have public facing televisions to turn the the option on on their TV. And that's something that would be embedded in it sounds like TVs newer than 1990. Yes, correct. Okay. So the FCC has been uh, related or uh, kind of working on this for a very long time. So uh, since 1990, all TVs have that capability and also okay. uh, streaming services have that ability cable and satellite providers have that service I've already just as uh, a accommodation to business owners as is already available on the mayor's office equity and inclusion website are guides on how to activate closed captioning so um, businesses and anyone uh, can go ahead and utilize that if they want uh, some assistance on trying to turn that on in their business but yes it would be any place that offers any sort of public accommodation and also has a tv that is on so and also newer than 1990 so this is not, there's no monetary cost for this. This is really uh, the two lead commissioners on this, Pamela Maurer and Stephen Persinger, who are joining virtually today. They, um, they have always, since even before the commission was created, um, they, they have wanted to use this as an opportunity to educate businesses on how to be more inclusive and this is just one of those examples that is a small but incredibly meaningful and no cost way to improve inclusion in our city great Are, is there anything that before we go to council member, other council member questions anything that commissioner mauer or commissioner persinger would like to add to the discussion um i would like to Hello, thank you for having us here today. I'm so excited to be involved in this. I wanted to add that this benefits the deaf and hard of hearing, but it benefits so many other people, other communities. It could benefit you too. Like if it's a noisy place and you can't hear well, the closed captioning would benefit you. And I would just want to remind you of how many communities it would benefit. And maybe Stephen would like to add some more. Hold on one second. Um, uh, let me pin Stephen. Wait a second. Uh, move to stage. Okay. The interpreter's ready. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your time and letting me have this opportunity. Yes, I'm so excited about this. And it's free. Um, who doesn't like free <laughs> to be able to increase accessibility? That's really nice. And also, 
it could even draw more deaf and hard of hearing people into Salt Lake City and uh, increase their business. So there's lots of benefits to this. And I'm grateful for this time that you're thinking about this ordinance. And then Pamela said, yes. And are there any questions that you might have for us? Council members, questions? I, Mr. Chair. I, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead. I, so I, I, I love this. This is fantastic. Uh, and I just wanted to find out how do we plan to spread the word about this? Um, because there is going to be potential hundreds of thousands or maybe thousands of sites in Salt Lake City that could benefit from this information. So how do we, I mean, maybe how all we of educate us the to, public. Yeah, maybe all of us commit to spread it through our newsletters, but unfortunately there is not enough people there. So sign up to our newsletters, but is there a plan for that? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that question. Uh, again, like you already said, one of the ways that I intend to help spread this word is through community newsletters, but also um, utilizing the disability organizations that exist in Salt Lake City to help spread that message, as well as working with um, economic development and our communications teams and um, any and also any um, ideas that anyone else has about this as well. So it will obviously be an ongoing educational opportunity. Like I said, our, our goal with this ordinance is not to be punitive. So even with the, if there is a business that doesn't know about it, um, something I would like to do as well is have um, flyers available so uh, people can just go up to a bartender, a store clerk, whatever it may be, hand them a flyer that just has that information on it. Or um, if they, if someone reports that a business isn't doing it, the, uh, the first stage is a warning. So again, it's very educational so even if someone is not doing it because they don't know they're not going to have a punitive fine it's going to be again just an opportunity for learning councilmember fowler thank you mr chair um i think that's great and i i would encourage you to take advantage of all of us sitting up here as well yes um, many of us uh, have a lot of different connections with different business chambers and not that economic development doesn't also have those connections but you have several small business owners sitting at the table right that have different connections and um i think sometimes it because we're like the big bad counsel we get overlooked in some ways yes um, but please feel free to use us and use the connections we have to get this out and to create events within our different circles um to to support this because it is incredibly important i think to all of us and we would be there for it not just through a newsletter but if there's other things that may come up please uh, reach out to us thank you so much yes absolutely Okay. Councilmember Valdemoros and then Councilmember Puy. I was wondering if you had already talked to business licensing and, and that could be part of their flyer when you know when you come and in, in in apply for a business license, be like, okay, if you know, if you provide a TV in your business, here's a new law. Please turn on the closed caption. This is a a new law for ADA, um, you know, accommodations for their city. So yes. that, that's also very helpful. Thank um, you so much. That yes, I will do that. Brilliant right suggestion. Well. Thank you. Great. Councilmember Pui. Just quick, uh, quickly, uh, like, you know, thinking. Uh, we obviously we should get the airport. Maybe they're already doing that. But yeah. with it, and and then when we apply for business licenses here, you know, when businesses apply here to get a business license, it will be a good opportunity to give them a little flyer. So. Uh, <laughs> yes. You want I, to step for, what, further? Let's do a, a flyer. <laughs> I'm like, thank I you, Anna. That. I, I, um, I, so just to clarify, I am uh, about to testify in a bill in a minute, so I'm listening to that. The oh. lobbyists are telling me we're next, and so I'm not completely out of it. Okay. Thank you. The, Anna, that was a great idea, by the way. Fantastic and I think we idea. Should do a flyer. Okay. I think we should fund a flyer so they can take okay. with the application. So many ideas from council members. I do have a question on this. Um, Sorry, and and first of all, I I'm excited about this ordinance. Great idea. I'm, it's it's exciting for me particularly, not just for this commission, but to just see our boards and commissions coming to us with 
direct policy recommendations. To me, that's really energizing to see like, yeah, these experts that we ha have asked to spend their time with us are actually moving the needle on things. So thank you for this. One question I do have though, and this is coming from um, my background as an architect. I know that the, the um, ADA laws in our country, there, there are time, unfortunate times when they become kind of weaponized for civil suits. And I'm wondering if this is a place where we, a business owner that doesn't know about this, there may be somebody that goes and knows that this law exists and targets that business owner. It, it, do, have we thought through that dimension of it at all? Because I, I can imagine there are business owners that just like don't understand that this exists don't have that turned on and then are all of a sudden facing litigation from private individuals that are that are kind of weaponizing it for the wrong reasons. Oh, um, there's a comment here. Thank you. Oh, I'm hoping it's OK if I make this comment, but that is a very good point that you brought up. I feel that's where we need to Sanderson Community Center for the deaf and hard of hearing. That's where I work. And we can continue to remind the deaf and hard of hearing people how to approach businesses if they notice that they're not having their captions on. They can teach and educate the business in a positive way. And the Department of the Workforce, we're under the Department of the Workforce Services, and we will plan to collaborate with them to go through that avenue also. Yes, we, we do have plans for deaf and hard of hearing, how they can approach it, and because and, some people won't know about it, and then we can remind them to turn it on. And do you, does that satisfy your question, do you feel? I can add as well. Please, Ashley, thank you. Thank you so much, Pamela, for that. Um, great plug for Pamela's wonderful organization to the Sanderson Center in Taylorsville. Um, so to answer your question um, from the side of someone who may be coming in and saying, oh, you're not doing this, let me file a lawsuit, they can already do that through the ADA um, because it, Captions, requesting captions to be on is a form of effective communication. Therefore, if captions aren't on, that is uh, going against the already in um, Title III as a public accommodation and then also um, just communications within Title IV of the ADA. So that already exists. Uh, this is, again, kind of like what Pamela was saying. This, at, having it as a city ordinance is more of a, again, kind of learning opportunity because there will be opportunity even kind of at the federal level for lawsuits. So this is almost in a way kind of helping prevent that because we're putting more attention and education towards this as a means of effective communication. I really appreciate that answer. So if I'm understanding it correctly, businesses are already under federal law expected to do this and we're just making a city ordinance as a tool to educate those businesses to do it more if yes in a way so if if requested if requested i see and they don't provide it then that's going against uh, effective communication so what we're doing here is we're taking the burden off of the individual for having to ask the business to do it and we're creating a more inclusive environment like by just already providing that as an accommodation for everyone that's a good answer thank you can i Any also other? add something too yes who's that Oh, my name is Casey Lynham. I'm the, um, the commissioner for the Accessibility and Disability uh, Commission Board. Um, one of the things, and I'm excited for this um, ordinance, and one of the things that every business should do is like, create any, um, any text, like any words that are in bold and make the, the words like, a little bigger for those who are having a hard time um, seeing it because their their vision is bad or something like that. Uh, from my background as a paraeducator for the Jordan School District, um, 
I think it would be awesome if every business will know on that. And also, I think every single business um, in the state should be trained on like emergency preparedness. Um, whether like we have been trained in in um, high school for the school district to learn about like you know what to do if there's like a fire drill or if there's like like a lockdown drill or shelter in place drill so that way they can just be prepared. Thank you, Casey. Um, so to Casey's point, something that everyone can do with the captions is there is a feature to um, customize them. So if they want them smaller or larger, as Casey was mentioning, uh, that is possible through the customization feature on various uh, technologies. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. Great. Uh, any yeah, other? You're awesome. Appreciate all that. Any other council member questions or thoughts? Okay, so this does not require a public hearing and we are set for tentative action on February 21st. Any other general questions while we have our ADA commissioner and... Oh, yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. I, I have a quick question, but it's not related to the subtitle, so thank you for, for that work. Uh, I, one of the things that I... Uh, one of the, administra uh, the administration was set up as a goal and I really care a lot about uh, within this department is the issue of the translation of the documents uh, across the board uh, or identifying what documents were necessary to translate, um, how, how we identify those and how we started tra the, the, the translating those documents. I can answer if you want. Yeah, that'd be great. So um, I, as you may know, we recently hired a new language access coordinator, Chris Macius. And so right now he is actually in the process of going through that, trying to determine what documents make the most sense to do first, how to prioritize, and also how to effectively ensure that we are communicating with people that those are available because if you put all this work in and money into getting all of these documents online but no one knows about them then it's kind of, you know so that he is working on this at that time and also i can have him follow up with you if you'd like no, I, would love, I, love, I would love to help with this. I mean, this was a goal for the 2022 mm -hmm. administration and is marked as complete on the website. So I want to make sure that, you know, how I can help with this. This is an important goal of, of you know, my constituents. Yes. There's a lot of them that just only speak, uh, you, know, na you know, their languages. Um, so I, I would like us to put quite a bit of effort on Absolutely, this. yes. You. And I will make sure that Chris follows up with you. Thank you so much for that question. Real right. quick, and to that point, translating not just the certain documents, but translating them correctly. Yes. It's one of the things that Ale came in talking about when he was first a council member of working at the county and having documents translated in a, in a way that doesn't make sense for an actual native speaker of Spanish, for example, right? That there's words being used because we're not actually translating them accurately it's like throw it into google translate, google translate and doesn't do it, it accurately and then be like we're good and it's like wait that doesn't actually work yes if, you, if we want people to understand what we're saying right so i think that's the other key to that what's important priority wise and that we're doing it correctly and accurately and i think too I that i didn't mean to woman's explain here <laughs> oh, please do anytime this is perfect <laughs> I think, too, to that point, that is also a huge consideration of both Roxana and Chris is ensuring that it is done correctly the right time because that is what's most important for the constituents. Absolutely. Thank you for that point. Yeah. So, Councilman um, Member Pui, we'll make sure to circle back with you and um, follow up. Thank you. That means a lot. And, you know, I think clarifying what actually was completed and what was not or is in progress will be useful for me to, to know where to, how I can help. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thanks. All right. Thank you. Appreciate those updates. Appreciate all your work. Um, we are moving on, I think, to item number four in that case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is that how you do it? Like Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, all right, num item number four is a land ex informational update on a land exchange to facilitate the bridge to Bachman project. At the table we have Ben Ludke, um, Council Policy Analyst, Tammy Hunsaker, Deputy Director of Community and Neighborhoods, and Kat Moss, the public lands, uh, one of our public lands planners. Thanks, Mr. Chair. The land exchange before the council was negotiated between the city and an adjacent private property owner. An equal amount of land would be exchanged between the city and the private party. It's about a 20th of an acre, which is about 2,500 square feet. So it's a relatively small amount of land. The exchange is needed in order to complete a capital improvement project. The council previously funded $1.1 million for two related capital improvement projects. It was a bridge over the Jordan River connecting to Bachman Elementary School, which has been completed. The other project is open space improvements on the western side of the bridge. This is things like lighting, landscaping, an outdoor classroom, and some safety improvements. So once the land exchange is improved, that part, the open space improvements, would be able to proceed. City code requires specific steps in order for open space to be removed from the inventory. So even though this is an exchange and a net zero exchange, it still must follow the same steps. So this includes things like a public hearing, which is scheduled for tonight. There's a mailing to all property owners within a thousand feet, which is more than the city does for other types of land use uh, notices to the public. And then there's a six-month waiting period after the public hearing. There's also the option for the council to take an advisory vote after the public hearing. The administration uh, welcomes feedback if the council would be interested in streamlining the process when there's a net zero exchange of land, such as the case today. Was there a question, Mr. Chair? Yes, uh, thanks. So you're saying council has an optional advisory vote, but it, that's not required and the administration could move forward with this regardless, or what is the? That's correct, okay. it's advisory. Okay, um, a question just uh, procedurally. I guess so, yeah. Um, zoning, the land we're deeding over to the private property owner is zoned as open space. What is the land that we are receiving and will those zoning designations be swapped? How does that work? It might be good to turn it over to Tammy and Kat for a presentation. Sorry, I a think presentation. they touch on that. <laughs> Yeah, I can kind of dive in and I'll just talk a little bit about the um, project, um, but thank you so much for this opportunity to initiate this disposition process. Um, next slide. And Ben kind of talked about this, but we did um, complete the installation of the Bridge to Backman project last year between 500 and 700 north across the Jordan River to connect Backman Elementary with the adjacent housing unit known as Riverwood Cove, which is the uh, entity that we will be doing the land swap with. Um, but the second phase of this is to develop the open space on the west side of the river. Um, currently, it is covered in really thick, invasive vegetation and poses a lot of risks for users and students that are now using the bridge. Um, but an analysis of census block data done by the U of U actually shows that this specific natural area has the potential to provide walkable access to nature for more children than any other natural open space in the whole city. Um, so public lands is really motivated to complete this development as soon as possible. Um, next slide, please. And um, this development will include kind of irrigation installation to support native plants, a variety of trees, um, looped pathways and seating areas, nature play features along the Jordan River, um, as well as an outdoor classroom. And this space will be publicly accessible as a park, but will also be used by Backman Elementary as an outdoor classroom. And so, as Ben mentioned, in order to complete this project, a land swap with Riverwood Cove LLC is required. And this project is currently under design. It will be immediately ready for construction upon completion of the land swap at the end of the six month waiting period um, that's required by the open space disposition process currently. Um, next slide, please. 
So the city right now is looking to trade the current city owned portion of the parcel, which is shown here in green, for the two red kind of sliver portions of the parcel, um, which results in no net loss of open space for the city, but will accomplish three things. Um, it will allow us to create an entrance to the Backland community open space um, where the bridge enters the property um, to provide access between the housing unit and Backman Elementary. Um, it will also resolve a current utility issue on the property. Um, currently a Rocky Mountain power line uh, is crossing over a portion of the Riverwood Cove property um, on the red sliver on the eastern portion of this parcel. And then finally it will resolve an encroachment that's currently shown here in green. Um, the parking lot for the Riverwood Cove housing unit is encroaching on city owned property and the new parcel boundary line will be along the sidewalk to the west side of the property and run along the fence line of their current parking lot um, and then the parking lot boundary to the east. So, so that um, parking lot is private. Correct. But on Salt Lake City owned property. Yes, currently okay. encroaching, yeah. So the project team's been working with Riverwood Cove LLC, the owners of these red portions, and they are in favor of this trade and um, highly supportive of the community open space project moving forward. Next slide. Uh, Council Chair, I will just finish up the presentation. Um, ben did a great job of talking about the pu public noticing requirements. Um, there are several requirements in ordinance that we are following, including the noticing within a thousand feet, two signs posted on the property, um, and we also were required to post a notice in a local newspaper for two successive weeks. And the ordinance is very specific. It can't be less than one fourth page in size. It even specifies the size of the font. Um, so we, we um, are following all the required steps and we did look into the ordinance and it is required even though there's a no net loss of open space. So we're following that. Unfortunately, we do have to follow the six month waiting period with this which will push the project out a little bit. Um, we understand why it is difficult to take property out of open space, but we are excited just to have this project move forward. Next slide. Oh, that is it. So we are through. And um, I am here because Real Estate Services within CAN will help with the land exchange for the property. And so we are working closely with public lands on that component of the project. Right. Um, ben, you had mentioned that this brings up a potential optimization or streamlining that we can do with our city ordinances. Can you go into that a little bit more? So there's no code amendment before the council today. Uh, it's more of a, if the council's interested in these narrow type of situations when there's no net loss of open space, should there be a carve out to not have to follow the exact same process or should all of it continue to go through the same process? So all of those issues that you, or issues, requirements that you just mentioned, the 1,000 foot noticing, the six months, et cetera, are all in city code? None of those are state code? No. Correct. Oh. Um, council members? Mr. Yeah. Mr. Uh, Chair. Councilmember Council Member Fowler and then Councilmember Dugan. Um, quick question. Weren't we looking at other ordinances regarding notification um, because of the like newspaper issue? Can somebody remind me, didn't it have that somewhere, City Lou? Were you referring to the right of way noticing? I can't or remember, the news but this, this has definitely come up in the past of ordinances and the newspaper is requirement. Um, and I know there's probably some state law regarding notification and things like that. But to, I think what your point was, Mr. Chair, is it is 2023. And I don't know who gets a written newspaper anymore that defines what font you have to use in a paper right and so I'm wondering if that the uh, somewhere in my memory we were looking at this somewhere else in another area and maybe it was um, the permit right of way that we're going to be talking about again but like I think probably a lot of our ordinances for notification wise has some things like this that maybe we should take kind of a holistic look at that might be easier um, I, I mean, I'm good with like the open space. Let's talk about that in particular, but it kind of brings up this other 
thing that we're in 2023 and aren't there different ways that we can have notification that still does what the intent is meant to do but doesn't require maybe quite the same hurdles in some ways that's just i'm throwing that out there for if anyone that, wants to do something <laughs> that sounds like a yep. suggestion so the recorder's office would be happy to compile a list of instances where we're required to notice in newspapers specifically that differs from the state and bring that to you That'd if that great. would be helpful okay sound good to council members sounds Senator amazing Dugan. i was just going to be there to point that if we can look at the streamlining some of these uh smaller net zero if he's uh i'd like that i'd like to streamline that process in that case I think I, I still see value in us knowing when land is leaving or entering the city. So I don't want it to just be like, yeah, just like swap land wherever you want to. So some balance point between what it sounds like we're dealing with here. And I'd also like it to be proximate so that we can't take all the green space out of one area and put it in another place that has to maintain some proximity. But thank you for this project. It's enhancing not just the quality of life for people there, but the safety of kids as they're not having to walk all the way up on 700 North and that sidewalk to get to school. And it's making the area prettier too. Thank you. Sorry. Mr. Chair, I have Valley. another question, if I may. Um, particular to this project, is this partly CIP funded? The the one point one million for both projects went through CIP. Yeah. Okay, um, and I I love the project. I'm not. This is nothing negative. Did we know at the time that there was going to be a land issue, or was that something that sort of like came up as the project was being developed and then kind of realized what was happening over there? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, two parts. Um, in order to facilitate the installation of the bridge, a Rocky Mountain power pole had to be moved. And so that kind of initiated the overhead power line issue. Um, and then we are, um, we've designed the open space uh, not contingent on we can amend the design but the most effective pathway from the um, riverwood cove across the bridge is through that parcel that's owned by riverwood cove llc so just efficiency of design um, also kind of prompted this great thanks thank you very much thank you the, we answered the questions you need to answer right okay <laughs> all right we're on to item number five which is an ordinance about right-of-way permit notification fees we have at the table sylvia richards council policy analyst jp goats director of uh, deputy director of public services and jorge chamorro director of public services but it looks like we have different people Go ahead, Sylvia. Thank you. The administration is proposing a new fee for the consolidated fee schedule um, of, for the cost of notifying adjacent properties when there's work done in the right of way. Currently, currently the city's not charging or um, recovering their fee for mailing to properties and um, owner, property owners and residents. The administration performed a cost analysis and uh, determined that the fully loaded cost per postcard is $11.58. The council needs to, not now, but the council, um, by the time the public hearing um, is finished and uh, when it comes back to the council for action, the council needs to determine um, whether the city will um, charge the fully loaded cost or something uh, or percentage of that fee. So at and I'd be happy to turn the time over now to public services. Thank you. You want me to go? Uh, council members, pleasure to be here. Uh, one of the things that we assessed when the ordinance 1430, um, let me see, 1432-36 came about was to identify those impacts that neighboring or adjacent property owners would, would encounter as a result of the work in the public way. One of the things to be able to 
address consistency as we go through and provide these notices is provide each property owner with something that would have a city logo that they could identify that would have a much less chance of it being thrown away or discarded uh, if it were a door hanger that was maybe an unsolicited item. The way we have proposed this in the $11.58 is a fully loaded fee that takes into account items such as uh, direct labor and unbilled building costs, which account for a little over 70% of that total cost. So if you back that out, just actual materials and things would be around $3.09. So that's just subtracting the 849 of those uh, direct labor and unbuilt building costs out. One of the things that we do prefer in this is that consistency. And by utilizing the Postal Service, we as a city are sending out the mailers. We have the ability to make sure that we have accountability that it was sent out, that there wasn't any question. So if we get a, a question from a council member who gets a concern from a constituent, hey, we weren't, we weren't notified, then we can then go by and in this manner be able to verify that they were in fact notified. Now this also includes notifications to uh, the actual uh, resident and if it's a leased or rented property, then there's also notification that's sent out to the property owner through our addressing system. So just kind of a little bit of background of how the cost came about uh, when we went through uh, city finance to get what that, that fully loaded fee was. Is there any questions? Yeah, um, does this, is this um, commensurate with the fees that we charge like uh, land use petitioners when they have to send a postcard out do we also charge them eleven dollars and fifty eight cents per postcard and that's outside of your department I realize so because my I'm guessing it's gonna look very similar to those postcards we all get that say such and such rezone may be happening in your in your street right one thing that I would like to add, and, and yes, I can see the surprise on, on the cost per uh, postcard, um, is that this is not the only option. This is the preferred option from our perspective, but the ordinance already um, spells out a couple of options for the um, permit requester to address this requirement, which is they can print their own uh, door hanger and notify and provide the city uh, with evidence that they notify those adjacent property owners. So that's so still an it, option? Yes. I remember discussing that. Okay. Right. And, and um, so in, in most, I, I, I can't tell the future just yet. <laughs> but uh, in most cases, if you present this fee to the, to, uh, the permit requester, it might be uh, the thought of, I can do it for cheaper, I'm just going to do it. But the requirement to, to provide uh, proof of notification is still there in the ordinance. So, Okay, so the requirement to provide notification is what we created a year ago or whatever, and yeah. that is not going to change. But we're, what we're doing is providing an option for the permit holder to say, I'll just pay the city to do that notification for me rather than doing it myself. Correct. I, is that clear? Okay. Council members, any questions? Is there anything we missed discussing yet? Uh, no, the one thing that I'll just reiterate is that with the preference being the postcard, yes, there is a cost, but that does provide a consistency throughout the city for all projects, and it, it brands it as Salt Lake City. So the idea is that with the postcard, that that notification would be less discarded than something that just didn't have city logo on it. it. It just makes it that much more official. And so I think the inclination is, okay, this is something from a government entity. I'm not just going to throw it away. Let me at least take a look at it. Councilman Dugan? Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I, I probably agree with that people would find, find something on their door hanger and just immediately goes in the trash just because, you know, they're not even going to look at it. So I agree, agree with your point about the, having the city, city logo. And I also agree that, you know, uh, we should charge what we get have to pay for. And, you know, we shouldn't say, oh, well, we're going to charge you only 50% of what the burden is. We should charge a full burden price because we're actually then uh, not doing anybody else a favor by uh, not charging the full cost of our work t to be done. So I'm in favor of the 100%, and I also agree with your point about 
the city logo on an official notification is important, but I think there's the give and take on the option is also necessary. Correct. Councilman Petro? As part of the ordinance, if they choose to do it by themselves, we've told them what information must be included Correct. and other penalties if they try to do it themselves and don't accomplish the goal? The ordinance doesn't address penalties. It just kind of says further down in the ordinance, these are the things that have to be included on the flyer and what the city would do if they so chose to go with that route. They would be given an example of size, medium, kind of what a door hanger would look like. Um, and, and they would have that option. I'm fine with them cutting costs. I just don't want them to cut corners while they do it. Correct. And one of the things with that and we've um, is uh, whether or not that would have the city logo on the the flyer which under advice of councils we've talked to the city's attorney's office they would prefer that we and i agree that we would not have or provide that city logo either through intellectual rights or misuse um, because anything could happen from the time that we give that to them that could there could be any number of things that could happen with a postcard we can pretty much specify what's on there and have that consistency i guess my thought is if I'm going to pull a permit and lay some cable underground or whatever I'm going to do in the public way, and I look at that cost, is the fully loaded cost, yes, the city should be, taxpayers should not be paying for costs that are incurred by private companies, but if this is a service to the resident, I can, and we're giving the applicant the option, I, ju I just anticipate that some people are going to say yeah i can do it for less than eleven dollars and then we're giving them the if we all agree that the postcard from the city with the city logo on it is better then we're disincentivizing that because it's so expensive and you, they can probably send their own postcard that will get thrown in the garbage for less than eleven dollars a postcard so i i would i mean i don't know who what economist or whatever can can tell us but is anyone going to use this service if it's eleven dollars and fifty eight cents a postcard? Well, if, if if you're if what what was said is true that the postcard that the city would send out is better and will be read, then we should not make it also so expensive that it will never be done. And that's just about I don't know. Or we need to change the ordinance, say that that's the only way that, that it can happen, but I think there are other issues with that. I feel I like remember. it's economies of scale. I mean, when you're developing four city blocks, like what's happening over at Post District, this fee might not be as onerous as someone who's developing one parcel at a time. So I think the optionality is really good, and I think we should highly encourage it. But I think with the, the scale of things going on right now, that this fee might not be as onerous to some developers as it is to me looking at it. When this is not a fee to a private developer on private land, right? This is a fee to a public utility doing work in the right-of-way the public way yeah. mm -hmm. so and, um, and if i may the economy if, yeah. they will be doing a lot of houses if they're running fiber along five city blocks so if we don't think that they're on one specific location yeah, yeah. And, and if i may the majority of these permits are going to be adjacent property owners so maybe one or two like if there's a sewer ladder or, that's done. I see. It is not like a large okay. linear project. So as you go in and see kind of the examples, if, if two notices at fully loaded be about $23.16. Okay. For a larger linear projects that affect a lot more, especially multi-housing units, uh, you know, that cost will incrementally go up as a result. But the typical property owner that's doing an application for sewer ladder or something in front of their house, a driveway apron, that cost is not going to be anywhere near as, say, uh, a large linear project okay. that uh, a public utility would be would be doing. I appreciate that, Council, uh, Councilman Wharton. Just, I, I think this is kind of what all of our questions are getting at. I, I don't think there's like a small mom and pop utility <laughs> provider out there that is going <laughs> right. to be burdened by postcards, and even if they're using like a local construction company, it. It, they're going to be hired by like AT and T, Verizon. They're going to cover those costs. Yep. So I'm I'm not worried about Verizon's ability to pay 
with no, these postcards. And to clarify, I'm worried about their decision not to use our postcard system and then do a door hanger, which it sounds like we've decided is not effective. Right, right. Or but less effective. That's why I'd be in favor of just requiring this. Um, Many instances. Or having a penalty for not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and another way to get at that might be I, there are costs associated. If, even if the Verizon does their own door hangers, someone in the city has to verify and, and field the complaint that that did or did not get taken. Anyway, so we we should be recouping those costs as well. It's all. And another thing to add. We're probably getting a little further down. <laughs> is that this verification that they did the pre-notifications is a precursor to them actually receiving the permit. So part of the permit approval is contingent upon them providing that, that verification that it was done. So but by us as the city doing it, then we're already you know, allowing for us to have that, that verification. Okay, so I think that brings up the question that maybe is the one that we should be asking, which is if a if a permit holder chooses not to use this service and to do their own door tag, does their permit become more expensive because then the, in, the cost of the permit issuer having to verify that those door tags were placed needs to be recouped? Whereas if they're paying this fee, then that's already covered. Yes. And also the immediacy of, for us, if they are paying the fee, we are going to do it, right? So they, we can approve that permit, uh, in an expedient way rather than waiting for them to go take the picture, submit the picture to us and verify that they actually put those door hangers in the right places. So there is an incentive in a way for, for that uh, company to go ahead and just pay the city because we are going to follow through. And at that time, because they are um, fulfilling the requirement, they can get their permit. And we will see uh, that those postcards are mailed right away. Does this satisfy the Well, why don't we just say we don't, that they have to use the city? So why don't we just say they need to go through the city to provide their noticing? Like, why? The, I, I don't have an answer for that because this was a discussion when, they, when the first ordinance was approved. Yeah. Uh, I, I understand that there were some discussions to give the option to them to do it on their own, and that's what exists right now in the ordinance. The, the current amendment that we are requesting is just to reflect the fee uh, uh, associated with the mailer that we currently are not charging. Yeah. Well, I guess, I mean, I am in favor of the change, um, but I would also, I also wonder if it would just make it easier on us as a city if we said, you have to let us do it. Because we have to do work whether you hire a private printer or not. We, we have to do work. So just let us print it and let us do it. Mm -hmm. And it'll be faster that for question, you. That's probably a follow-up question for attorney's office or? Yeah. Well, I was going to ask, Sylvia, do you have any of the background of where those discussions came from of giving, keeping those options open? It sounds like something that a council would do. Of like, oh, let's I'm make sorry, sure everybody I, has that. I don't have that background. But, but maybe we could follow up on that because um, I'm curious too and I think I'm sort of at the point where I, I'm sick of incentivizing mana require um, in a lot of different areas right and so but maybe there was like this really amazing robust discussion I doubt it but maybe there was um that made some points of why we kept it open remember a lot of discussion i on i everything there was a lot of discussion but not <laughs> on that i don't remember a lot on that part i mean we created this yeah yeah okay. germano if I, if I could add yeah, um <clears throat> coming from the planning division the i believe it's a 300 foot radius for for planning petitions i don't think there is that option they, they must use, they use the city service. to, yes, right. I think that's true. And there, there are efficiencies to the postcard as opposed to the other. It takes less time. We've got fewer one-offs that, oh, okay, did, you know, permit number 27532, you know, did they? Maybe the follow-up question. Did they follow up with the email? Can we try and list the follow-up questions? Do, how much does a planning postcard cost? Is it about the same? Because that permit, does, that process doesn't have an option, can we just remove the option? Is that legal or possible for us to do? 
Um, and I want to confirm that if the under the current system, so I think we're all a yes on let's charge the fee, but the under the current system, if a, a applicant chooses not to use the city service, are we then, is there some other way we're recouping the additional costs of on city employees and burden on taxpayer? Because we know that that work, some of that work, like the person that we have to hire and pay their benefits and all that stuff, like they still have to be there. So m making sure that the other costs, if they choose not to do this, are fully loaded. Does that cover our questions? Okay. Councilman Petro. Um, if we send the postcards and a constituent says, I was never notified about this, we, I assume then would, would assume that liability and would interface with them. They would have to absorb that liability if they did it themselves. And would there be any recourse that we offer through the city to that constituent? I don't, they just don't get the permit unless it happens. And that way we we've know had that it so happened. many we've had so many constituents coming to us and say I was never told about this or the noticing wasn't done properly right or something like that, and it seems like when it's an in house that's a very very clear cut thing right you, we have all the documentation yeah. you know we we have set processes, um, but if it goes through a private entity that seems like it opens up a potential. So getting back to the same point of like, we would like to remove the option for the private entity to do it themselves. It just seems cleaner if we do it. <laughs> I think that, I think, I think all the questions okay. are going to the same point. So what we'd like to know is, can we just remove that option? Okay. Fair? We'll okay. look into that, yes. All right, thank you. Thank all you. right, we are moving on to item number six, which is an informational discussion about uh, title transparency in the Housing Stability Division budget. We have Allison Rowland, Council Policy Analyst at the table, as well as Blake Thomas and Tammy Hunsaker, Director and Deputy Director of Community and Neighborhoods. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is an informational briefing on transparency in the Housing Stability Division budget. The administration, as you may remember, uh, is conducting a internal review of the Housing Stability Division in CAN, the Community and Neighborhoods Department, and this is actually ongoing. So in May 2020, you may remember that uh, the administration documented about 12 million in dormant income or surplus HUD program income. HUD, of course, is the Housing and Urban Development Department of the federal government. The administration has now documented additional program income and other funds that need clarification. There is about 20.4 million in dormant and other income that appears to have accumulated over the decades. And Blake and Tammy will discuss more details about this in their presentation. Um, I do want to mention that the division also, the Housing Stability Division also budgeted over 3.2 million dollars for the direct delivery programs, which has already been reported to HUD. So the precise figures listed in the transmittal will be subject to revision as the administration's review continues. And the administration also anticipates policy discussions with the councils for each of the programs that, that are involved in this. Um, and those would include budgeting procedures, goals, activities, conditions, and approval processes. And these new policies could be formalized in either new legislative actions, so resolutions or ordinances, or in administrative policies and procedures. So to sum up, um, both the Housing Stability Division and its predecessors used financial practices which don't adequately track the sources of these funds, and they also allocated them in non-transparent ways. The division was essentially running an unofficial revolving loan program and using the repayments and the interest charge to provide additional loans to applicants. Neither the administration nor the city's annual independent audits have found evidence of financial malfeasance, so there are no funds missing, for example. But over the years, the council has repeatedly requested information on the division's budgeting practices and has not received a clear answer until now when it's beginning to, to become more clear. So far, the administration has rectified the division's practice of non-transparent budgeting of program income, 
They've proposed improvements to bring the programs in line with current best practices in budgeting and transparency. And this process will continue for the next several years. The administration recommends four process improvements. One is to establish formal policies and procedures. Two is to increase budget transparency. Three is alignment of, of, of the, uh, commis uh, the committees involved with the Open and Public Meetings Act. And the fourth is establishment of an official homeowner revolving loan account. Most of the staff policy questions are focused on the administrative recommendations, but I wanted to draw your attention to the two attachments. Um, the first is existing direct delivery programs. So because there are 10 of them, um, it's probably, you may need a refresher on some of the names and, and some of the programs. So that's included in attachment C1. And then attachment C2, there are the administration responses to council staff questions on the transmittal. Those, um, unfortunately, there wasn't time to include those completely in the staff report, but those are also in the staff report. And I can turn it over now to Blake and Tammy for more information. Okay. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to propose recommendations for your consideration regarding new and updated housing stability processes that will better serve our city and its residents. I just want to quickly thank Allison uh, for a detailed and accurate summary um, and council staff who are incredibly talented and have been willing to get into the weeds with us uh, as we've worked to identify more transparent, efficient, and collaborative ways to bring our HUD program income and other funds uh, into alignment with best pra practices. So. Thank you to council, your staff, and Mayor Mendenhall for being so encouraging of constant improvement and maximum community and human impact with our dollars. Um, the administration and council have committed more than $24 million this fiscal year supporting affordable housing, and we want to ensure that any further funding dedicated to the housing stability team and its programs is done in collaboration with council. Uh, with a cohesive vision for how to best support our residents. Tammy and I are here today to talk about proposed updates to our policies and procedures so the council and public can better know what's happening and where our city's housing dollars are invested. As Tammy and I have gotten our bearings and our roles, we've found a need to improve decades uh, long practices. Um, realizing there are better ways to do this and we'd like to do that by, as I mentioned, uh, establishing formalized policies and procedures, using those new policies and procedures to ensure that any funding decisions are open uh, or subject to the Open and Public Meetings Act, improving budget transparency, and lastly, proposing a revolving loan fund for those dollars uh, that's subject to annual review. Now, on the next slide, Tammy will provide an overview of housing stability's programs to set the table for our discussion, and we'll go from there. Thank you, Blake. On an annual basis, the Division of Housing Stability deploys millions of dollars to address the critical needs of residents, businesses, and neighborhoods. They are the city's grant administrator providing management and oversight for HUD, FEMA, state, and local sources of city funds. Most of the funding administered by Housing Stability is actually passed through to external nonprofit organizations and other city departments. So for example, the road home often receives rental assistance to house those experiencing homelessness, or housing stability provides funding to the transportation division for bus stop improvements in qualifying neighborhoods using CDBG funding. So a lot of the funding is um, passed through to these other organizations. However, the division does retain some of the funding to deliver programs directly to the public. Um, these programs we have coined in the transmittal, we call them the direct delivery programs. So these are direct services to residents, businesses, and developers within the community. The majority of these programs are focused on expanding homeownership opportunities. And um, the direct delivery programs are listed on this slide in the middle, and I won't go through all of them, but just to give you a sampling of what these programs do, there is the Home Rehabilitation Program, which provides funding to homeowners to address, address health and safety needs 
within their existing single family homes. The city currently holds approximately 360 loans with 5.6 million in outstanding debt. And there's approximately 20 new projects completed on an annual basis through this program. There's also the home buyer program that provides mortgage financing to further affordable homeownership opportunities. The city currently holds approximately 215 mortgages with 19 million in outstanding debt for this program and provides several mortgages a year to help further homeownership opportunities within the city. And then there is also the Community Land Trust, um, which was authorized in 2017 through a uh, resolution allowing uh, the housing division to sell properties at below market rate single family homes. Um, but this program is in effect kind of functioning as an extension of the home buyer program. When the city issues a mortgage um, to a homeowner, there's a buyback provision that allows the city to buy the home back if the homeowner decides to sell with a, within a certain time period. And the housing division has bought back several of these homes and placed them in a community land trust model, reselling the housing unit, ground leasing the ground um, to ensure perpetual affordability for these homes. Um, so these are, this is just a sampling of the programs that are offered by Housing Stability. They've been transformational for many families. There are approximately 20, or not 20, 12 staff members in the Housing Stability Division who are dedicated to delivering these direct delivery programs. <coughs> these staff members are oftentimes the interface between the city and residents who are looking for um, solutions for housing stability. Next slide, please. The, but, so the issues really come down to um, with the direct delivery programs. Um, they're long-standing issues. The programs have been off operating under a certain way for a lot of years. Um, and although they've had a p positive impact on residents, businesses, and neighborhoods, we have identified shortcomings, which are the, the purpose of today's briefing. First, there's been a historical lack of budget transparency, both with the amount of funds available for allocation and with the process for allocating certain funds to certain programs. Part of the funding for the direct delivery programs has been allocated transparently through the annual HUD funding log process that you all go through. Um, however, additional funding has been allocated through a different part of the budget, making it unclear to the council about how much pr uh, funding was being allocated to each program. Uh, second, while internal policies and procedures have been utilized by Housing Stability, these procedures comply with federal requirements. Formal policies have not been adopted as either part of the administrative rule or through legislative action. So those are the two uh, kind of concerns we're coming to you with, it's budget and policy. If we could go to next slide. This chart identifies kind of all of the funding that is available for the direct delivery programs. As of last November, there's tw about 23 million um, within these cost centers for the programs. Of the 23 million, 3.2 million has been budgeted um, with HUD for specific programs and activities. So on this slide, the top section of the chart, the 1.6 million from CDBG and the 831,000 for home, that was transparently budgeted through the annual HUD funding log process for the current fiscal year. Um, 20.4 million, the sum of the amount on the bottom of the table, is available for allocation pursuant to federal or other restrictions that may be attached to the various funding sources. Um, there is a focus on the dormant PI for CDBG and home, and I believe there's a briefing next council meeting specifically on those funds, so I won't get into those at this time. Um, some of this funding has um, accumulated over decades. Other funding is left over from programs that are no longer active. While the accumulation um, of the funding has a long and varied history, at the current time, I think it's important for the council just to be aware of the resources available 
to allocate and combat the housing crisis um, and to address other community development needs. So there are various requirements and funding restrictions, but it's basically the $20 million that is available for allocation. If we could go to the next slide. So um, current, the current administration and staff, we have identified these longstanding practices and have come up with the four um, process improvements that both Aunt, um, Allison and Blake mentioned. First, establish formal policies and procedures. Building off of the internal policies and procedures that the division is currently using, the administration is recommending the adoption of formal policies and procedures as either part of the city's policies and procedures manual or through legislative action. This will establish a common understanding between the administration, the council, and the public from which future budgetary and policy decisions can be made. Um, of course, these policies will need to comply with the various um, federal and state regulations that are attached to the funding sources. The second process improvement is to increase budget transparency, and the administration is recommending implementing a budget process in which all budgetary information for each program is clearly identified through the budget process. To do this, we will submit information to the council that shows the cost of the program, the revenues that the program generates, as well as ways to evaluate the program's effectiveness and outputs um, through performance metrics, essentially. This will ensure that the city is making data-informed decisions when budgeting. The third improvement is to align with the Open and Public Meetings Act. Funding is currently allocated through internal loan committees that are not public bodies created under OPMA because the direct delivery programs are not created by statute, rule, ordinance, or resolution, which is the requirement to trigger OPMA through state law. Um, as we develop formal policies and procedures and do establish these programs through statute, rule, ordinance, or resolution, um, we will, of course, develop a way to allocate funding that's um, codified in the policies and procedures and follow OPMA. Since I think it's important to remember that the division's programs are primarily focused for residents and businesses, so we do need to establish a way to allocate and award funding while keeping sensitive personal information confidential. So we are looking into ways to do that. And then finally, the establishment of a homeowner revolving loan fund. If the cost centers that um, these funds are administered through are not treated with a revolving loan fund or an RLF model, unencumbered funds, including the ongoing accumulation of principal and interest will obviously drop to fund balance rather than acting as a replenishing source of capital to further the city's homeownership goals. The city has various RLFs that are these pools of capital from which loans can be made. For example, there's the RDA loan program um, and the Economic Development Loan Fund. If there is an RLF established for these homeownership programs, the council would still have the opportunity on an annual basis to allocate the available budget for the revolving loan fund um, every year. So with um, those th uh, four process improvements, I will turn it back over to Blake. Next slide, please. Here's the tricks. Oh, actually, I will really quick. We did add this slide because there have been a lot of questions from council on the roles and responsibilities and coordinating um, between RDA and housing stability and um, really all housing functions across the city. This is a, a table that was actually created a couple of years ago when we were having similar discussions, and this is how we laid out functions in 2020. I think for the most part, um, we have been following this table with some exceptions. And internally, I think within Housing Stability can, and I think the RDA even thinks along these lines, the RDA's programs are really tailored to providing 
um, financial assistance to developers and what housing stability does is providing that financial assistance directly to tenants and homeowners. So that's kind of a rough division that the administration has been utilizing. Um, so we look forward to having more conversations about the division of roles and responsibilities as we come forward and have um, future discussions on the on the programs. So with that, I will turn it over to Blake now. Thanks. Next slide, please. Okay. Just in conclusion, the as Allison mentioned in the opening remarks, our our hope or intention as the administration will be to submit additional information to you all on the di direct delivery programs uh, as we work to formalize the program policies, um, the budgeting procedures, the goals, activities, conditions, and approval processes. So we consider this to be an iterative process over time where we evaluate each of these programs. Um, we also intend to inform decision making and increase transparency during the FY24 budget process with the information that we've shared today. And then lastly, our intention is to coordinate housing funding and activities across city divisions and departments to streamline and um, target resources for maximum impact, alluding to Tammy's earlier comment about um, data tracking so we can see the outcomes that we're getting from these programs and have a better um, sense of where our investments are best placed. So thank you for allowing us to present and I'm sure there are no questions or comments. And it's so simple. Um, but, <laughs> here. but we're here if you need us. I appreciate the, <laughs> that. That was actually a really, I, I thought a very clear presentation. So thank you. Thank you for finding these things, first of all. Um, council members, questions? Just clarif no, just clarification, Council I, Chair. I'm just looking back and forth. You've yeah. just had a lot of questions today. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Dugan. I remember uh, when the, this, the housing roles and responsibilities, when a homeowner is looking for a loan, they, weren't look, they would just look for a loan, and we would say where the fund would come from because we had a better idea of, of the loan, f the funding source. On those loans, is that true, or am I yeah. mixing apples and oranges here? How does the home on, home buyer program work? Okay. Yeah, and and with that revolving loan fund, that say that twenty million dollar, that just sits in one account, and then we can pull from that account to go to different loan sources or uh, programs. Excuse me. Am I, am I, yeah, my, the, my question is confusing because I'm probably confused. Those details would be worked out as I, I think if there is a revolving loan fund established, there would be legislative policies attached to how that loan fund is administered and how funds are allocated to different programs. But I do imagine there could be a loan program and on an annual basis, the council could allocate available budget to the different programs out of the same Mm -hmm. loan fund, but we may need Mary Beth's expertise on that as well because there would be accounting that would need to take yeah. place as well. And, and if it's helpful to, I think Tammy might have alluded to it, but the program as it exists has AMI qualifiers and different policies and procedures that aligned with HUD that we're being administered to with our goal and what we're presenting day, today being that administrative or legislative rule so that um, it's aligned with the federal requirements, but we also have the city priorities from a council and administration so, perspective. Let's say I'm a AMI qualified home buyer and I'm interested in purchasing a home. What, like, do I go to a traditional mortgage lender and they say we can't lend to you and then I can call the city or are we working with mortgage lenders that are working out in the community? How is this program at what point does a home buyer interface with the city and how does that work and are we offering reduced loans? Like what is it, the benefit that we're providing? How does that all work? The benefit that we're providing, and we will have more detail on the programs okay. in the future, but in general, it's below market financing and also financing that may provide a mortgage to families that may not otherwise qualify. I think there's a, a risk assessment that's done when evaluating the eligibility of a household's um, ability to, 
obtain a mortgage through the city. Um, but we do, I think we are a little bit more flexible in who we will provide a mortgage to. So it's expand, it truly is expanding home ownership opportunities for those who otherwise wouldn't have access to that through a actually, traditional bank. They actually have to come to the city and work with a city employee to yes, uh -huh. so, show them, show all their income and the mm -hmm. home purchase price and appraisal and all that. And I think that's important to remember. There is a lot of administration that goes along with some of these programs. It's not just getting funding out of the door and then moving on to the next project. Housing stability staff works every day with um, families and households accepting loan payments. They're actually administering these loans for the life of the loan. So then the link to the community land trust, if I'm understanding this correctly, we have a loan program for home buyers and they're people who may not qualify for conventional financing, potentially slightly riskier, um, there's hi higher risk involved in default, uh, where a traditional bank would not lend to them. Is that how, in the cases where unfortunately there is a default, is that how we're acquiring this home that then gets put in the community land trust? We're repossessing, or how, how does what's the how, what's that link? When a, there's a buyback provision like a right of first refusal on title, with, I think believe it's within the first 15 years. So when a homeowner decides to sell that house, the city has the option to repurchase the house. And they've been doing that. This program has been in operation for decades. So they've been repurchasing the house and then reselling it to a family. So it's not just the homeowner or the potential homeowners um, using the city for a mortgage, we're actually, we have inventory of homes that are recycling, that we're buying back and then um, reissuing a mortgage and selling to a new qualified family. So any home that, any homeowner that purchases a home through the home buyer program gives the city the right of first refusal or only specific? For the first 15 years, it's my understanding. The first, if they keep it for 15 years and then sell it, the city no longer retains that right of first refusal. And they can sell correct. it on the market. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the right of first refusal, in the CLT model, there's an equity sharing right. um, program to keep it affordable in perpetuity with just the, the how the home buyer program has been functioning historically. I don't believe there's a restriction on the... Um, the price that the city would repurchase the house at, it would, I think it would be current appraised market price. Is that correct? Councilmember Dugan? On, on that same vein of about just on the home buyer side of the house, and you, you know, we have 215 mortgages out there, $19 million worth of outstanding debt. And, you know, we're trying to have the transparency and we're trying to be part of the, the, uh, the approval process. But each one of those are not coming to the city council. Is it like, is it the idea that, hey, we're going to allocate X amount of dollars to the home buyer program, and then the administration has a list of priorities and a list of uh, check marks that they need to go through to provide that loan at once a year? Because that would be really getting into the minutiae for we're making, it's coming to us for approval. That would be established through the policies and That'd procedures. Be, okay, mm -hmm. okay, and that's still yet to come. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, just, is it something where we anticipate this being like, uh, revolving loan fund to me sounds like there's just always money available until there's not, but generally there's money available, and when a person asks for the funding, we can go through a process, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. If the outcome is yes, you qualify, then we provide them the loan. It's not like the NOFA that the RDA does where they have to be in line to buy their house on this date of the year and we score them against each other to come. <laughs> that is to come. Um, I think the NOFA process may not translate to not issuing mortgages I would to think families. Not, yeah. yeah. Side. Yeah, this is homeowner. Councilmember Valdemar. Yeah, I have, thank you. I, I have some questions. Um, so it, it looks like in one of your slides, so um, you mentioned, I want to make sure that we're doing the, the revolving loan fund is for home buyers, or is it going to be a all-encompassing revolving loan fund, and then we'll 
and then we'll dedicate to home buyers and also to business, you know, like the economic development one. And then, because I, I feel confused that in one of those slides you said just revolving loan fund and not home buyers loan fund, revolving loan fund. So one it says HRL yeah. and the other one says mm -hmm. RL. Yeah, it would be, F. we are proposing that it would be like a home ownership revolving loan fund. So um, it could be um, funding for the home repair program. So that, that would be for like existing homeowners that need a critical home repair. Mm -hmm. um, like for example, um, a senior homeowner with no other means may need a new furnace or something like that. That's the type of service that the home repair program provides. They depending on AMI, that will they will provide those services either as grants or as loans. And so um, the revolving loan fund could feed that program and the home buyer program. Okay. Um, there's some other home ownership centric programs that it could yeah. fund. All right, it makes sense. And, and the, the feeding of that, the feeding, so whatever the money's coming from, it's, it's, is it general fund? Is it federal funds is that state funds so it's a combination of everything to we we'll put it in here and then we start taking out and obviously the interest that some of this will generate goes back to this to have a federally a hud funded revolving loan fund there are um, hud requirements that you have to follow you actually have to have it approved by hud okay so there are complexities with having it hud funded okay so where is the funding coming from then for our revolving loan fund? That would be up to the discretion of the council. There are some unrestricted funds available within that table that I showed you within the 20 million. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, okay. Um, another, uh, two more questions. The other one was, um, as we decide, okay, here's who's going to do the housing, here's going to do the repairs, and here's going to do economic development. CDVG is kind of, in like you can do both uh, home ownership uh, related stuff and also economic development are we planning on splitting them those as well so that economic development actually does economic development stuff with cdbg money and then housing does housing stuff or or are you also going to administer the economic development ones for cdbg Housing Stability currently administers one program that's economic development related, okay. which is the Neighborhood Business Improvement Program, the fa aka the, fa the facade AKA program. The facade, uh -huh. um, but they do that in close coordination with economic development. Um, there are a lot of HUD regulations that need to be followed with all of this funding, um, well with the HUD funding. Uh, so even when housing stability acts as a pass-through, there's very specific requirements that must be followed in terms of environmental review, um, Section 3, Davis-Bacon. Oh. So uh, housing stability staff is closely involved yeah, even if money sense. is passed through to a different department or a different organization. It, it makes sense. And that will need to continue to happen. They're the experts on those processes. The reporting is messy, so I think that will be fine. Somebody that knows that reporting yeah. process. The, third que the last question and third one was um, this funding that we have available, that the money that you showed us that we have there, these are to stay or are we going to have to return some of this money because it's so old and we didn't do anything with them? We, with will, it, sorry. we will get into the briefing next week on the dormant program income. We are working with HUD to retain and use the okay. funding in the community. It will require an amendment to the five-year consolidated plan. Okay. Uh, we are working with HUD on the 14 million in dormant program income. We have a briefing on it next week so we can get in greater detail, but it will require um, a substantial amendment to the five-year consolidated plan to use the funding. So we'll have to identify eligible activities and uses, update the plan, submit it to HUD. HUD will have to approve the plan to use uh, those funds. And, and if not, they will tell us we want our money back. Yeah. To yeah. be okay. clear, that $14 million that we're going to talk about next week is entirely separate from the 23 or is embedded within part of it. Part of it. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to t uh, bring up a... Well, go ahead, Councilman Fowler. Sorry. Because no. I'm going to change the topic, so oh. if it's related. Yeah, there's lots of relatedness. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Um, well... 
so I don't even know where to start right now, but um, let me start here with the idea of the community land trust. Um, when the, it, it sounds to me like in part, it is HUD funded. Is that correct? The mortgages being provided to the homeowners purchasing homes are HUD funded. Um, so the mortgages being given to homeowners, the money to, to acquire the land, who is that funded by? I believe that's a mix of the various sources. Being? HUD, um, other local, some of those funds that are no longer used. They, it's complicated, <laughs> but it's a, a mix of the funds. Uh, we could go like back that's to not, but Cindy. Oh. Just add, um, and, and these guys have been great to, to dig into the weeds yes, with Allison definitely. on this um, and with the rest of us too. Um, but sometimes there are federal funds that exist and then once that program is closed out, then they're not considered federal funds anymore. So that's why it's a little bit harder for Tammy to answer that. So at some point, maybe it was a HUD money and you had to go through some amount of regulation and then that program ended. And so then we had money that maybe not isn't necessarily subjected to the same regulations because it's kind of like, if I may in lay terms, it kind of falls to the general fund, if you will. Revolved back and it lost those restrictions exactly okay so the hud program income and other funds in the table are a good point section to point to to that point of the the mix of funding okay so if you look at the table there's river park funds identified on there that falls into that category okay that's helpful for me thank you yeah that was a grant that closed in 2000 and has since accumulated and I know that this is like deep in the weeds and you guys have been working on it for a long time thank you I want to first just say thank you to Tammy and Blake because I've been asking these questions since I've been on the council so um, thank you but I do want to kind of get just a little bit more into the weeds just a tad bit so um, with the community land trust who decides which properties to acquire what, what process process does that go through it has been um, since it is linked to the home buyer program. So, say there's a home out there, and under the home buyer program, it's still within the 15 years of the right of first offer. The homeowner decides to sell, they have to go to the city first and ask if we want to purchase it. I think oftentimes we do move forward if, if there's budget available. And I think I may be misunderstood. So, I thought that we also acquired property before there was a homeowner and then got into this mortgage with the homeowner. So, Did I misunderstand that? No, over time, so the homebuyer program has been operating for decades. The city used to build um, some of these homes. I think that's originally how it started. We would build or buy and then rehab. Um, package that with a, a home buyer. It used to be first time home buyer. Now it's just home buyer if it's a qualifying home buyer and sell those homes. So a, there's a, a big pool of those homes out there. So as they're being sold, we're repurchasing them. The city did um, recently build two homes, but we understand very much that there's a division now. Housing stability is not doing any more development. Okay, so that helps me. So like a lot of the inventory we've had, we've probably, it's been on the books for a while, mm -hmm. probably, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not the, okay, right. that helps. Um, but can I add one um, piece of information? The, we don't just buy back the home. Oftentimes there has to be budget allocated to rehab the home to get it up to standards to resell it. So there, there is a process there. Okay, I'd like to, at another time, probably sit down and talk with you guys about this. Um, when the like mortgage comes in and the interest comes in to the like, let's say all of the interest comes back to the community land trust, even if that's like a very low amount of interest, that money is <coughs> then 
using not, I'm trying to, is then not subjected to the HUD requirements, right? So for example, it is, it is still. So even if it comes back through a HUD reason that it was out there, then it come, it comes back and is subjected to that HUD regulation. Yes. And it, um, the dormant PI accumulated because, um, we were keeping additional PI um, program income. We have corrected that practice, and so now program income is um, reported on an annual basis back to HUD, so it's basically included now in the next funding round of federal grants. Okay. Could I ask, I'm sorry, Council Member, um, so that's true of the homeowner program, but that's not true of all the funds that were previously allocated from HUD, right? Some of those are now no longer subject to HUD. That's true. That's so correct. that's current yeah. CDBG and home. Right. Right. I, I guess my bigger question is, if we were to create a revolving loan fund, then my question is, if the mortgages being used are subjected to HUD requirements, then anything that comes back in form of repayment, interest, anything else, is also subjected to HUD requirements. Is that correct? Yes, and we've been recapturing and putting the program income back into the funding cycle. So if the council is supportive of the administration looking into a revolving loan fund, we as an administration would um, work with Mary Beth and figure out a proper way to structure that. Um, some of the mortgages were provided with funds that don't have restrictions, so um, we would have to look at uh, at those details and propose mm -hmm. a well, process. So if we were to bring back um, that money and put it into the, the PI fund, if you will, essentially we could put that towards different CBDG, like when we go through all of our HUD grant monies. Could that money be used for those programs that that um, apply for that money, like the home buyer program and the home repair? No. Oh, like know. during the during our during HUD our annual application process, would it be like the nonprofits that apply the annual allocation? So if we didn't have enough CDBG, like we CDBG, we, we received this, but we would like to add more to it. Can the we? program or income. plus above the annual allocations? Yeah, yeah. The Could, program income being. That's what's happening now, starting this. So it's, yeah. Now it is. Mm -hmm. So it would go, again, I'm sort of calling it the general fund, but I'm calling it like the HUD money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the HUD money general fund. It files mm -hmm. back into that. Then when we go through the process of nonprofits and service providers coming to us and saying we have money, then we can say, oh, we have this PI fund that can supplement some of these things that we're, not, we're feeling that we can't fund because we're out of money. We're now doing, we can now have this. Correct. Okay. That's helpful to me. And, and yeah. I'll say because I, I don't know that we should be in the business of providing services. There's enough people out there providing services. And every year that we do the HUD money grant stuff, I think, why is the city taking all of this when there's other services out there? I'm not saying that we shouldn't do this right now. It's simply like there are other nonprofits that are do, providing a lot of the services here that I just want to take a look at and say, are we the people that are in the business of providing the service? Or are we the people that are in the business of helping fund those people that know what they're doing and providing the service? So I know that was a really long way to get there. Thank you, Mr. Chair, but thank you. Councilmember Wharton. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> see. So um, housing stability, okay, we're going to be getting in transmittal about the mayor's proposed perpetual housing fund. I assume that that'll be in housing stability as well that has not been decided yet oh, okay um, then you probably won't be able to answer my next question <laughs> which is how does all of this relate to the mayor's proposed perpetual housing loan or perpetual housing fund I believe we have another work session item scheduled in the very near future to get into that exact question is that okay am I understanding that correctly Cindy requesting. Okay. requesting Okay, then I'll just preemptively say I think that we'll probably have a lot of the same questions about um, the transparency of that and making sure that there's like appropriate oversight on that as well, but I'll just leave it at that. So we've been talking about this for a long time, but we are still ahead of time 
and our next item is a break. So I want to change, like, I want to talk about one other thing that came up with this is, which was in the past, we've been saying, okay, RDA does development, housing stability does programs or does serve whatever. It was presented a little bit differently today. And I want to explore that a little bit because I, 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 I like a little bit. I, I think I like what you said, which is RDA is good at speaking with this type of person, which is a developer. Economic development is good at speaking with this type of entity, which is a business and housing stability may be the right place for a individual tenant or homeowner. Is that, I, I wanna kind of discuss that with the council and see if we, if we like that, because in that case, I'm wondering if something like the RDA's um, nine line Westside Community Initiative slash nine line um, uh, ADU, affordable ADU financing program is better suited to be handled in housing stability, even though I know that's RDA money. So there's like some shell game that maybe needs to happen or I don't know, but that we've asked the RDA to do some things that really are relating to an individual homeowner or person. And if that's the distinction that we agree with, do we need to revisit? Is that the distinction we agree with? And then do we need to revisit some of those things on both ends? Councilmember Fowler. Thank you. I think you are hitting one of my points right on the head. And that is, I, I don't disagree that that hand in housing stability may be the right place to, to which is why we did this, to create to to advance programs, but some of the things within what we're looking at aren't necessarily programs. And that's why I was going back to saying, Services isn't this versus. more, in my opinion, we've talked about this in when we talk about homelessness, right? Or we talk about it when we talk about other things of that the city maybe shouldn't be in the business of providing all the services in certain areas. Like we provide the service of making sure there aren't potholes or that you have electricity, but even that we don't provide, right? We like call. And so th my question, it's always been this, is why is the city reinventing the will in some of these programs instead of saying, let's take this money that we have. And, and again, maybe, maybe a housing loan fund is the right idea to keep having some surplus. I don't know yet. It's kind of new and I'm exploring that in my brain. But, but I just don't think that we should be reinventing the wheel. There's enough amazing organizations out there that do the work, including home, by, home owner programs, including rental assistance, including mortgage assistance, which I recognize some HUD money cannot be used for that, but those are also very important things for me. Um, and saying, well, if the city didn't take $1.6 million of CDBG, we could have put $1.6 million into programs that are doing this already and that are there. And maybe that's where that interface with the community comes from, is reaching out to those nonprofits or those organizations that are already doing it and have more boots on the ground than us reinventing the wheel. I, and I, 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 yes, I agree with that. And I think I see it as two separate questions. First, should we be doing this at all? If the answer is yes, then are we interfacing with an, a homeowner or a developer or a business? And, it, and is that the question that answers which department does that specific program? If, we're, if the answer to your question is no, then the second question is irrelevant because we're putting that money out to a private nonprofit to do that work. But if we decide, no, the city is the right place to do it, should it be on those lines of, here's the demographic that this department works with, here's the demographic that this department works, and here's the demographic that this department works with. I like that, but I want to, Councilman Valdemaros. I have a question. So let's say the second example of CDBG, so that every, every year we, you know, the city, the administration works on asking for CDBG funds, and then we take some, we go through um, all of the processes, and we decide, okay, this portion of CDBG will be administered by it the city and administration, and then this other portion is going to be given out to a nonprofit. So um, the CDBG funds, like the, the HAT regulations, does it have to, are we the pass-through? Is the city the pass-through of CDBG? Yes. And, okay. Yes. So, okay then. 
so I, so yes, then we should be doing this. But like, maybe the question is, if we're the pass through, then the question is, we t we take it and we give it out, but we don't do anything. We're just the pass through, or we just don't participate at all. Like we just don't ask for that money, right? I think that's my point. We are the pass through. We can't not participate. The question is, what do we do with that money? And, we give it and to for me, the we give the answer well. is. And, and I think in some ways, while you say it's a two-part question, I'm not sure that it is necessarily because I do think that, and Tammy brought this up, that I don't think like a NOFA process would be the right process if we did do a home buyer type of thing. I, I, I'm not yeah, certain yeah. about that, right? Yeah. But a NOFA process certainly is the right thing when we have like, here are your X requirements for a new development or a rehab project or whatever it may be that comes through the RDA. Right? So I just don't think that, again, we need to be maybe reinventing all of the programs. There's people out there that do it already. Let's just fund them better. Could I? It, I mean, if, that, if the answer to that question is always no, we shouldn't be doing it, we should do that, then the second question is irrelevant. So I guess my assumption is that there are some programs that the city should be doing, but maybe I'm wrong. And that's the first question we need to answer. Could I um, ask for maybe a clarification from uh, Blake and Tammy on something that Councilmember Valdemoros mentioned? So the CDBG money is not expended directly by the by the whatever the rest of the government's called. Sorry, um, is not directly spent by Housing Stability. So that was what I was trying to depict on the slide with the, the chart. So Housing Stability is the grant administrator for the funds, like the oversight of the block grants directly from HUD. So there's reporting requirements, allocation, plans, a lot of requirements. Part of the funding is passed through to external organizations, for example, I use the example of the road home for tenant-based rental assistance. We provide the money to the road home. There's reporting requirements back to us. Um, we also, there's capital improvements like with transportation and engineering using funds, but then housing stability also is awarded some of the funds through the federal grant, the, the funding log process, and utilizes other budget to carry out programs directly to homeowners, businesses, and developers. So Those are the direct delivery programs. That's what we've coined a direct delivery, and that's what that's what we're we're flagging today that there could be those process improvements for. Okay. So what you're so maybe what, what Councilmember Fowler said. Well, maybe those ones are the ones that if somebody else is doing it, are you know, do we do it or should we just do the same as the rest, like pass through, like have somebody else do it? And just to give an example similar to the road home so that you have context in the internal and external partners, something like the SLC divisions, the capital projects, that could be a project like bus shelters that the city is awarded to partner with UTA on and implement just to give you an example. We're just administrators. Like, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, we're just kind of like the overseers, make sure that we do reporting, make sure that things are allocated the so, right way. but. But if we had a rental assistant, let's say we have rental, let's say we're going to offer rental assistance, so we have one staff at the city that deals with people that need rental assistance, but we know that there is the road home that also does rental assistance, I'm not sure, but it just, then why are we both doing rental assistance? That's the question. Yeah, that's the question. That's, that's what we're yeah. trying to answer. Right. So, and I, so, okay, that's a good question. I think the fundamental, one fundamental role of housing stability is to administer the federal grants, and that is a non-negotiable. That is that our happen. mandate. We must do that as the municipality, right? So absolutely that work needs to be done, and that is currently going to some internal things within both housing stability and other city departments mm -hmm. and divisions, as well as outside nonprofits. So the question that we're really asking is, are those ones that we're keeping, should we keep them? Right. And but why? I don't think we can answer that question this right now, but yes, Councilman Warden. So two things. We have the um, our housing SLC plan, um, and I think that all of these things that we're talking about have, 
have been an extension of that council adopted plan. So I think we would have to have a new housing plan. Um, uh, and then second of all, we're, I feel being increasingly um, local governments are being asked by the state to take on housing as an issue and to come up with their own plans. So I don't, I would just say that I, I think that there are, pre so there's the pressure from sort of above, from the higher level of government. There's our own plan that we adopted. And then I, I feel that there is definitely a lot of more pressure from residents for the city, um, for cities, all cities, to take on more in terms of housing. And so, in direct delivery types of models. Um, yeah, yeah, I, yes. So for me, the, those are, I think that's how we got where we are. Um, and I, I, I want to, I'm happy to have the conversation as well, but to answer the question, I think that's how we got to where we are. And that's what keeps pushing me to keep, to, to want to keep furthering these kinds of programs with the city. I think that's a good point. Okay. So. And for whatever it's is there worth, anything that we did not answer today? Oh, that needs just to be I think relevant to this conversation, the thriving in place plan as part of that exercise, as we're kind of in the final drafting stages, is what programs are being recommended. You know, tenant relocation assistance program or policies or whatever that looks like. And part of that has been an exercise of what programs exist already in the community where it would be best served to pass money through versus something that doesn't exist or would need to be a program delivered by the city. So just wanted to share that as something that we are thinking about and considering with those recommendations that'll be highly rele relevant to these programs. So I hope that helps that our state of mind is in that place. I appreciate that. All right, are we ready for a break? Mr. Councilmember, like this, 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 this short. Um, so I, you know, and I remember, and I was looking, uh, uh, you know, to some of the funding that was requested through CBDG last year. And Never Works is a good example of an organization that has not only the track record but the experience, and you know, the, also the knowledge and the, the, the know-how of uh, housing and all of these things. And I re remember the, the they applied for. Uh, for over three hundred thousand dollars in in funding, and it wasn't recommended, but this council gave them some of the money. Uh, I think this is a good example of something that it is being done there and is being done well. And maybe we should figure out how to fund it when they come f come for that money. But I just wanted to you know bring that up a little example of this because I think it was more about theory, or, you know. But this is a specific example of our neighbor works that is working very hard on housing, uh, and we couldn't fully fund them last year. I we have another discussion scheduled next week for very related things. Okay, this is the last. Yeah, yeah. So I, I appreciate the reason why we're here early on was because we didn't really have a very good process and the transparency to $20 million, and we kind of f figured that out. So I appreciate the uh, digging through and investigating and coming up with a solution here. Uh, I mean, we got into a deep conversation here on, on a sidetrack from what the original intent was. Hey, we had a problem. We uh, have come up with a solution. And part of that solution is making sure that it's transparent and that the city council is part of the decision-making body and not just uh, a, um, a sideshow. So we want to be part of that uh, decision-making body and we want to make sure it's transparent and that we have a good process in place so that we don't end up in 10 years being back at the same spot going, what the hell happened? So thank you very much for the discussion. Thank you very much for this uh, coming up with uh, potential uh, solutions to it. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we're on to item number seven, which is a break. I propose we take the full 20 minutes and come back at 4.33. What was the time again? 4.35. 4.35.
let's get started again. Thank you, council members, for coming back on time. Uh, we're on item number eight. Number eight is our follow-up discussion on the accessory dwelling unit text amendments. Um, I do think we still have a lot to talk about. We'll have Brian Fulmer, council policy analyst here to give us a brief introduction. We have Nick Norris and Michael McNamee from the planning division available to assist us in this discussion. You don't have another presentation, do you? Okay. Here to answer questions. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a follow-up to the January 17th, 2023 Accessory Dwelling Unit, or ADU, briefing. During that briefing, the council discussion was primarily focused on the following five topics. Off-street parking, maximum ADU size, an owner-occupancy requirement, required setbacks, and whether to keep the conditional use requirement. The series of optional straw polls is at each of your places and included on pages one and two of the council staff report. As a reminder, a public hearing is scheduled for tonight's formal meeting with a potential vote February 21st. Also, information about the proposal is available at tinyurl.com slash ADU text amendment. As you mentioned, Michael McNamee and Nick Norris from the Planning Division are here and are able to answer questions the Council may have. Mr. Chair, where would you like to go from here? So uh, first, thank you for reminding us that we have a public hearing tonight on this. So uh, as we discuss this, I think it is important for us to say where our minds are at um, and discuss like if we have where, where each of the council members are. And I think that's good to give the public that information so that when they come to our public hearing, they can address some of those specific things that we are still deliberating. Um, obviously, as with any public hearing, we, we say these are straw polls. As with any straw poll and anytime there's a public hearing, that public hearing may change our mind entirely from what we, what we quote unquote vote in these straw polls. So I just wanna put that out there for the public that, that we're still very much discussing and these are the five things that we're currently still trying to see where we land on. Um, obviously come tonight, tell us anything that you wanna tell us about the AD ordinance, but these are the topics that are rolling around in our brains and that would be the most helpful for us to hear from the public on tonight. Mr. Chair, may yes. I ask a logistical question? Go ahead. Um, do, you, do we just sort of plan on going down this I would like list to go have? through this list okay. first because they're the ones that were identified at the last. And if we still have time at the end and other counselors want to bring up additional things, I would like to do those at the end of after we can get to at least some sort of idea of at least we all know what we're talking about with these five things. And you may have said that and I was not paying attention. I apologize. I don't think Mr. I did. Chair. So thank you for the question. So I think we should just go down the list if that's okay, Brian. So the first one is parking. And um, the way that I see this issue is that, okay, ADUs in all cases are required to provide one additional off-street parking spot. There are five exceptions to that that are listed in the proposed ordinance. And these three, um, and it sounds like there are three, to my recollection of the conversation, there were three that we were discussing whether to keep or remove those. those. Councilman Fowler. Sorry, quick question. Um, just to remind me, a, a minimum of one off-street parking space, that's not in addition to? It is in addition to what's required for the primary dwelling. So if your zoning district requires you to have two off-street parking spaces, you need one additional to build the ADU. But there were those five ways you can get that, that requirement waived, and that's what we need to decide whether we want to keep those or remove them. And the three that I remember, the first one I remember is, um, quarter mile of a transit stop. If, you, if the property is within one quarter mile of the transit stop, they do not have to provide that additional, that's proposed. Um, I would like to keep that. I think that that one makes sense and that, that falls in line with a lot of our other ordinances. Uh, is there anyone that would like to propose a different position on that? Yeah, I, I understand the, the desire because I'm 
all about the clean air and all about using public transportation is I kind of sometimes look at, and we've had this discussion about, you know, the chicken and egg. We want to make sure that we have a robust public transportation system, and we don't, we're not there yet across the city and then across a number of cities, uh, city streets. And so I have, I have trouble with that one uh, just because of that. Uh, the the f services are not where they need to be for people to use public transportation on a reliable basis. But I also understand that we can't get there unless we have the demand for those buses and transportation. So I'm, uh, I'm on the, uh, I'm still deciding if that is a, a hard requirement or not for the quarter mile of the bus. That's from Petro. I think the data we've already collected demonstrates that the people most interested in actually executing on ADUs are people around Liberty Park and we're trending towards smaller lot sizes. This is an onerous barrier potentially for the lot sizes that we're talking about who tend to actually use ADUs. So for once we're on opposite sides and I'm all for the not designated parking. Councilman Fowler. It sounds like Councilman Petro is interested in keeping the quarter mile exception. Councilman Dugan is interested in removing it. Am I? I Putting words in your mouth. I do okay. not. I do not need a dedicated parking spot. On on street parking is fine for ADUs. And I'm with Councilman Valdemoros, Councilmember Wharton. Um, I or also Councilmember <laughs> Petro. <laughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. We all look alike. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Wharton. I'm sorry. Okay. So I also have concerns, just because um, the um, the unique problems of having the very, very small blocks and small streets and the avenues and um, the uh, s steepness of the inclines in avenues. So, so my, I have two things and it's not, the small lots are an issue in any historic area of my district. So that would be from Guadalupe to Marmalade to um, avenues. And I'm still concerned about an ability of a person that has potential mobility challenges being able to do that. Um, however, um, I am more concerned about the bike. Uh, I don't think that the bike lane like solves that concern. So that's a bigger issue for so that's me. That's that's a separate thing. I know. Lane. I'm just saying though. It, I'm I have a little bit of an issue keeping the quarter mile transit but the for me the bigger issue is the bike okay exception does anyone want to propose a straw poll on the quarter mile transit one to start with you did well not, just for record two. keeping sake mr oh. chair i would propose that we keep the off street parking but also keep the exception if you're within a quarter mile of transit Okay, so that's the straw poll. Thumbs up means you would like to keep the exception in. So we have five voting to keep the exception, two, Councilmember Wharton, Councilmember Dugan, to remove the exception. Mr. Chair? Can we, yes, So Councilman I just Dugan. wanted to add a little piece of, that, I, that I think is driving my decision making in many of these things, um, but to me is uh, the impact, uh, I mean, removing barriers for ADUs is, uh, it, you know, the, it, it's key on this and what is driving me. And then the second one is um, no adding barriers that, barriers that increase the cost of building ADUs. Uh, so just to me, those two pieces are the ones that are, you know, uh, educating me on how to, how to decide on this thing. Okay. Mr. Chair, I would like to add to that, like my reasoning as well for this. It almost feels like we, and I, and I understand um, where we live and uh, as a planner and with planning vision and sometimes we've struggled with this, you know, idea and this hope that we'll leave the car one day aside and we'll, you know, we'll rely more on our feet and or, and or public transportation or other means other than the car. So it's always, I'm torn usually because of these decisions. But at the same time, we are, we have, I'm looking at this ADU more as from the housing crisis lens. So I'm thinking, okay, so it's more, so for some or for this decision, is it more important to have a parking spot that an ADU where somebody can live in? 
And to me, the answer, if I have to answer that question, it's clear. I'd rather have the ADU where somebody can live in than having the parking spot and that commodity in a way, you know, the comfortableness of having somewhere to park your car. It's better that somebody's inside house than uh, without a car than than the car. So that's where I'm coming from and how I see. Thanks, Councilman Valdemaros. Okay, so the next one's very similar. It's if you're within a half mile of a city designated bike route. So without rehashing all the same arguments, is there any additional discussion specific to bike routes and not public transportation that people would like to bring up? Well, no, we are being phrased. Uh, so I know which direction to. No, no straw has been. Yeah. I'm just bringing up the next point, which oh. is very similar to, and I, I'm, I'm requesting that we add new things to the conversation, but not say the same things we've already said, because I think these are very similar. They're very similar, but one's using public transportation, and one's using a bike, and the bike lanes, anyone could have enough bike lanes. We're going to have neighborhood byways, passes, and they're all going to be within half a mile of every place. And people can't, aren't using their bicycle to get to work all winter long, hot summer months, and so that portion is not there. They're using the bikes for more exercise and more leisurely and not for public, not for transportation to and from a work environment. So that's not gonna, just because I have a bike lane isn't gonna take, take away the need for a car or anything else of that nature. So this, this exception is, I think, is a, a, a poor exception at, at trying to get to that point where we may be in 25 years, not right now. Is that a straw poll? We can make that a straw poll. It's more succinct is that we, uh, we remove the exception about the one half mile within a bike lane. Any discussion on this straw poll? And remember, we can all change our mind based on the public comment. Okay, so tonight. we're saying even if you're within a half mile of a bike lane, you, you must still provide. You have to provide. And Councilor Dugan's straw poll is that even if you're within a half mile of a de city designated bike lane, you still must provide an off street parking spot. <laughs> Let me make that exception. So, so thumbs up if you want to if you want to eliminate the exception and require the spot require eliminate the exception is what we're doing don't care about the parking spot where's my thumb go that is a that is a so good the, way to, so thumbs up if you want to keep the parking spot show your feelings thank you council member fowler all right sorry Okay, so we have four to three with Council Member Wharton, Council Member Valdemar, and Council Member Dugan supporting the straw poll, the remainder uh, not supporting it. So that means keep the except the straw poll fails, but that keeps the exception in. <laughs> okay, the third one that I think is still is relevant. Be seeing all of you bike into work all week next week. If y'all could help me with some West Side bike security so that I don't get seven and eight bikes stolen in a year, we could talk. Okay, okay, okay. Let's stay on track. The, the third one related to parking that I understand to be um, a point of discussion is whether or not if you have uninterrupted curb directly in front of your house long enough to park a car to city standards, does that accept you from requiring an off-street parking spot? And we discussed this last time. Um, who? Did, which one it, are you a number? Uh, you're a B, sorry, letter B, or um, which one are you discussing? It's not on. Oh, it's not that. on the, Okay, it's not on this. Oh, it might be on that list. Um, so I actually am going to vote with council member well which with, with where i assume council member dugan and wharton are on this but for very different reasons and my reasoning is because we all just voted on the off-street parking ordinance one of the things we did in that was we removed any exceptions for on-street parking and in when i was on planning commission and when we discussed it in council my understanding was that the reason we were limiting that was because it's hard to it's it's hard to administer I also think it leads to individuals saying, well, that spot in front of my house is mine and you neighbor may not park in that and I don't like that. And so I am okay removing this exception, but for I think different reasons then, but maybe they're the same reason, I don't know. But that's where I'm at. I support that reason. Um, but again, like there are parts of my district, historic districts that with no driveways, because there were no cars. 
and where houses are so close together that they touch. And there is not enough room for people to park successfully now. Um, and I worry about adding to that. So I am voting the way that you're voting. <laughs> um, at, because of the, uh, we can't change these things about these neighborhoods because of the, the historic housing. That's so that's where I am on that. So I, you know, I understand this, and I, you know, I driven through some of these streets, and there is, I mean, I've been in Denver many times, uh, and you know, many parts of Denver are very complicated to park, and you have to walk, you know, like a long time to to find some parking. But I, I also want to make sure that we remember that. Um, many of these neighborhoods that are, we are worried about are not going to most likely get ADUs. Uh, so we are basically preempting many other parts of the city that will have likeliness to have ADUs. So we are making it harder for areas that could have ADUs by removing some of these exceptions. So basically we are thinking about these neighborhoods, specific ne parts of the, of the city, um, but you know, it's the likeliness that there is going to be Many ADUs in this in the street, and it's going to change the whole shape of you know that you know that street, uh, and we're going to have dozens of extra cars, or so even two or more, three more cars is very unlikely. And removing the exception again, it, you know, it applies to parts of my town, my 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 district that could benefit from these exceptions. Um, so I want to make sure that we remember that this. These rules apply, you know, that we are trying to preempt um, a problem that might not exist, uh, it might not happen, and and the city showed us with yeah. data that these problems don't exist. Is there anyone that does not understand the exception? Well, if there were a way to write this so that it that areas where there are larger blocks and is more spaces between houses. Um, had a different, uh, there was some way to adjust that, um, that would make, that would work for me. Um, because I don't want to, my, you know, my no vote to take away from areas in your neighborhoods that could accommodate those cars, but I don't have that option in front of me and I don't know how to craft that option. Um, and I don't know how to do that either. And Can I don't, it, it, it's not that it's that parking is already, um, stopping people from being able to live in the area. So it's not uh, about adding many cars, but adding like any more cars, it's already not working. So I wish that I didn't, you know, have to like take something away from the residents that have that option or the neighborhoods that have more space, but there's no way for me to do that. Councilor Fowler. Mr. Chair, to that point, I'm wondering, because you brought up a good point before I had to run out real quick, but um, there are many neighborhood, many areas within my district, similarly, that just don't have driveways. And so I, w I wonder if we could, craft, to your point, craft something that says, you know, if there isn't a driveway, you have to provide there has to somehow be a spot. I, I don't know what that looks like either, but I can see the concern on both sides of me. And I know we have really incredibly talented and creative thinkers in planning and the, and the city attorney's office. So I'm sure that there could be something that- uh, Don't send it back <laughs> to the drafting board. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, that, I think it would be a quick fix of like, maybe not a quick fix, but looking at something of saying, it, there's, there's got to be something there that accommodates for both of the, these things. The way I see it is this exception is helpful in cases where it would be geometrically very difficult to provide that off-street parking spot. And that, I'm arguing your point, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the case where there are larger lots, it's not going to be that hard for them to provide the off-street parking spot. So I'm okay saying that that larger lot, yes, it may have enough space in front of their property to park a car, but it probably also has enough space. And so, so they can do an off-street parking spot. They, they probably could accommodate that. Whereas, but what we're saying is that in lots like Chris's, district where he's discussing where the lots are smaller and it would be hard to put, provide the off-street parking spot, we're not allowing that exception. My belief is that the other exceptions that we have 
kept in there will cover most of those situations. That we have proposed to keep in there will, yeah. Well, I, so anyway, I think we're holding hope, huh? We're are we ready for a straw poll on this? Yeah. I think if we, we are. If we say that you have to dedicate off street parking, especially in places where there is no driveway to speak of, we're essentially eliminating ADUs as a possibility for that area. No. If they can qualify for a different exception, they still don't have to provide it. Correct. So this is only if they are outside of that quarter mile, the half mile, all the other things that we said, and they, could, they have that spot, but then they, does that make sense? Because I feel like the other point to be made here is that the lower avenues probably is under similar gentrification pressures that Rose Park is under. Mm -hmm. And you probably have homeowners there holding on with their fingernails to a generational real estate investment for whom an ADU could potentially provide a vibrant lifeline to maintaining housing for their family generationally. Yes. And so I don't want to inadvertently shut the door on that because we didn't get creative thinking about parking in this moment. Thank you. So, but it's a tension that is difficult to balance right now. Thank you, because I would point out, I mean, these are the areas of the city where we point to and say, there's been an ADU here for 50 years or 100 years, and there's a way to make it work. So, you know, people in the lower avenues are prepared to have ADUs. We have houses that are stacked on each other, um, full houses, um, and in Marmalade as well. So it's not that people are opposed to, um, to that dense to that density but there there has to be a way to make it work um and i don't feel like this this particular parking requirement is conducive to making it work thank you i think we're ready for a straw poll does anyone want to propose that uh, i want to i have a question about straw polling because i cannot find the you asked if, some, if everybody was clear about this and i am not and so i don't want to straw poll like i don't want to vote my yeah, so this page because this, I'm does not my, include that thing. Yeah, that's what I That thought, one that we're I, talking about right now. And so I, you go ahead with the straw poll, but I would like to not, it's fine. not vote on this straw poll because it's not, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. All right. So, Councilman Puy, no. Well, this is obviously a larger game that I, I did, one of the reasons why I didn't go to law school, but I, um, so, now the question is, can we, to me, can we figure out a way to, is there a way to find an answer to these questions that were brought up here? Like, are there ways to like segregate some parts of town or not? Is that doable? Uh, and by doable, is it a, you know, can we have- Not make segregation. <laughs> Our goal. Would... Sorry for my choice of words. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I can provide some context on some of these older areas that found ways to make it work and the way that we made it work is that our zoning didn't regulate these things it allowed it i mean that's just the truth right we didn't have a parking ordinance until the 50s so anything built prior to that was providing parking on their own merits without any city requirement so if you have a lower avenues where the predominant development occurred prior to 1950 any parking was not required by code it was just done because that's how people developed it's also important to note that we had a very extensive streetcar system and we didn't necessarily need to worry about parking um off street parking as early as other cities did so okay so had, thank you nick Mule so <laughs> i guess i can make the straw poll i propose that we remove the exception for on street parking from the list. Off street parking. On street okay, on parking street, to okay. remove your off street parking requirement. Talk about logic. <laughs> and again, my reasoning is different than others and you can choose not to. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five <laughs> voting yes to remove that exception. One voting no being Councilman Petro and one not voting being Councilman Valdemar Ross. Okay, can we move on from parking, or does anyone want to talk about parking for another 20 minutes? <laughs> Dan Dugan. <laughs> okay. Um, size is the next item. The planning staff had originally proposed seven, the current ordinance is 650. 
Um, the planning staff's original recommendation was 720. The planning commission forwarded us a recommendation of 1,000, as well as an exception for 12,000 square feet if your lot is larger than 1,200 square feet if your lot is larger than 12,000 square feet. Um, and we've talked about this extensively, I think. So it's two separate questions. One, do is the base restriction 720 or 1,000? And two, do we give another exception to larger lots to build larger ADUs? So I think they're two separate questions. Councilor Mpui. So I, I, I want to advocate for um, something that you said. Um, uh, th you know, I'm not going to you know, put words in your mouth, but I, I mean, you did say these words. Um, so, <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> but, but that, you know, your property rights and then your property line. Um, and uh, and I, th I believe that we, as a city, were working very hard on trying to create family, uh, family size housing. Um, and, uh, you know, pretty much everything we do is trying to find ways of, uh, you know, allowing uh, you know, young families or, or families to live in our city. And by reducing the size, we are making a case that, you know, that we don't want those. Um, again, I think we're trying to, if we are against this, the size of this, we're uh, actually limiting people that could potentially create one family, one, one, one ADU that is the size of, that could allow a family to live in. Um, just for the fear that all of the ADUs are going to be 1,200 square feet or 1,000 square feet. Um, so to me, uh, those two are, you know, hand in hand, even though there are two questions. I'm okay on in allowing uh, size to go, uh, you know, to 1,000, and then if the lot is high, to, to allow for 1,200 can square we feet. Vote on those, can we discuss those separately, yeah. though? So first, going from 720 to 1,000 is the base requirement. Um, and I think it's important to note that just because that's the maximum allowed, that doesn't mean every lot would have a 1,000 square foot thing. If it's a smaller lot, you still have setbacks and heights that would restrict it to potentially less than that and separation from the primary structure and all that. I feel that's like giving our very skillful planning division as much latitude to make good decisions is in our best interest and it streamlines things. So if they can accommodate up to 1,000 on the property, these people are skillful enough to help us navigate that, and they don't have to go to anyone else to consult, don't have to do refusals. Let's do that. Mr. Chair, can I ask a Council question? Fowler, yes. Um, and this is for planning. Like, where did 720 That's come from, question. and where did 1,000 come from? Was it like, I mean, question. in some ways, I feel like planning commission may have just picked a number out of a hat. But I feel also that 720 may have come from somewhere. Uh, so I can speak to where the 720 came from. Um, so that matches the current allowed maximum for other accessory structures in single family residential districts. Okay. Like, like a garage? Okay. Or a shed. Why we picked that. Um, and the idea was what we allowed for ADUs was smaller than what you could get for a garage. And so we wanted to at least match what you could do for a garage. And then when we took it to planning commission, um, the commission felt that that wasn't large enough for a family sized unit. So that's why they suggested. And, and if I may, cause I don't, so the discussion for the planning commission was more about this family sized unit that you'd need a thousand for a family sized unit. Yeah, I don't know that for me that's the intent of an ADU necessarily, but that's just... I think that's the policy question. Is that the intent or not? I mean, my what we've always talked about in some ways is like me, it's there for supplemental income. Do lots of, lots of questions there, I think, but I don't know that my intent ever was to look at this of like putting another home. I was just telling Chris, and again, I know there's other requirements and things like that, but the house I live in right now is 900 square feet, so... If all the and but it's a huge lot, so then the there you could have an ADU bigger than the house I live in behind my house potentially. A given, yes, that there's other setbacks and things like that. I understand all that. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't know that that was the intent, other than for me the intent was saying uh, allowing the things that we already allow. Which, I mean, not already allow, but already exist, like mother-in-law apartments, right? That sort of have that 
one bedroom, one bath area or something along those lines. Anyway, so I, I would stick to the planning staff recommendation of 720. Um, Apple. Huh? Apple? We I have a question okay. for the staff. I, I'm just throwing it out there. I can shuffle. Oh. Go so through this. Is, I appreciate the explanation about the 720 being based on something. Is there, um, like, I understand we're not talking about standardized things, like, but does it make sense to go from 720 to 1,000? Like, what is that? What does that mean or translate to in terms of of an ADU? It's it doesn't seem like that's another bedroom. It's just what it would yeah, be. It is. is it? Yeah, okay. at least if not more. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, does it make sense to jump? Um, well, I guess that's a policy question. Um, yeah. Is there something that for me? It's not about creating family housing like that it's about having the a smaller house on the property so does it make sense to increase from 720 to something that isn't a two bedroom or do you just keep it at 720 does that make sense i guess i, I think that's a question for us yeah <laughs> well is this ordinance supposed to create family housing and if we say no then we should keep it at 720 if we say yes then we should go up. And I think we might all be at different places on that. And I think for valid reasons on all sides. Okay, but I want to know, like, it do, if I throw out, like, no, 720 is not enough, and 1,000 is too much, it should be 800. Like, is that based in anything? Um, well, putting on an architect hat, I would say 720 is pretty comfortable for a two-bedroom, but not huge. Uh, but it's not probably big enough for a three-bedroom. So if, what, if the goal of the ordinance is to make, and that's just me throwing things out in the air, but like I would probably have a relatively hard time getting three bedrooms out of a 720 footprint. But a thousand square feet, I definitely can get three bedrooms out of it. Okay. So, so for me, that's too much then. Um, I just yeah. wonder if, if there were other reasons to enlarging from 720 to 750 or 800 or whatever. Uh, to make it cost more but like I don't, I don't think that's the reason i think the reason is to make it for more housing so and that's also not a good reason yeah. for me so. yeah not a good reason at all but i'm saying okay so i guess that's kind of what i'm asking is like what are the other arguments out there and i appreciate everyone going on this journey with me <laughs> um so unless there are is some other compelling reason that i'm not thinking of and that hasn't been discussed i would like to keep it at 720. Councilor Poy, I just want to add, I want to add a little piece to this, and I think that again, uh, all of us have like different you know points of view, and they're very valid on this. I you know I just judging it from what I see in my neighborhood. Most of the housing that is being done in uh, in most of the city, but specifically in my in my part of town, is studios and you know one bedroom. Uh, and our schools are struggling, and and you know so we are we are in. A, a huge need for for housing for families uh, and if this will allow an ADU here and there for a small family to start I think that we shouldn't get on the way of that okay uh, so that is my argument yep I think the question is I'll, I'll propose a straw poll I would like this to be a tool that can create multiple kinds of housing including family size housing so I'll propose a straw poll that we in, we support the 1,000 square feet Okay, so that's four yes, three no, no's being Councilmember Fowler, Councilmember Wharton, and Councilmember Dugan. Um, the second question on the size, and I, I'm gonna try and make us go a little faster because we're, we're going along, is whether or not we wanna give an additional 200 square feet of allowance if your lot is over 12,000 square feet. I'm gonna say no on this because I think it's just a tool for, I, I, I don't, I don't, I think it's a tool that rewards only a very specific part of the community and, and really isn't useful. So I'm going to say, let's. C can you elaborate that. on that one? Uh, 12,000 square foot lot is in all zoning districts, but a couple enough that you could just split. That's like an enormous house. 
Um, I don't necessarily think we should reward. We should say, because your lot is huge, you can go above this standard that we think is good for a three bedroom. I just think, okay, I'll say in, in maybe the less politically correct way. I think it's a way to make very wealthy families be able to build even more wealth. And, and I don't think it's, that is getting anyone with a 12,000 square foot lot. I don't think is getting to our anything affordable. So I, I don't think it's meeting city goals. Is the straw poll going? Don't have it or keep it? Keep, take it out. Okay. So, so 1,000 is the max regardless of where you are and how big your lot is. Okay. So I, I, I get you, yeah, so I get your argument and I, I you know, you know, I guess at the, at the end of the day it's housing. Um, and we need housing and we need to densify even parts of the city that will not densify naturally and this might allow it. Um, so to me, again, we are maybe worried about too many of this happening and the likelihood is it might, it might not. It most likely not, I, actually. I think maybe I didn't say that. Well, and that's a valid point. I, I think that 1,000 square foot is enough to make a family-sized house. And so if that's our goal, I think that's fine. I think 12,000, 1,200 square feet doesn't make it necessarily better for family-sized housing. It might make it really great for a really swanky pool house. But and that's not the goal. The straw poll is to we scratch that one. Scratch the 12,000. Oh, yes, if you want to scratch that. Correct. Fine. Okay. Oh, yes to scratch Yes to take it out. I was, I was doing that because I think Chris was headed backwards. Oh, wow. We're all on the same page on that one? Okay. Oh. We're moving that one. I owe someone. <laughs> okay. Um, the next one, and we talked about this last time, but the next one on the list is owner occupancy requirement. I said similar things last time, but I still would like to remove the owner occupancy requirement. If you look at who owns lots in our city, half of them are not owned by the person living there, roughly. I'm making that up, but I think that's relatively accurate. Um, half of them are rental units, and so we're saying this is a tool to create more housing, and keeping an owner occupancy requirement is saying we are only letting this tool that could create more housing be used by half of the applicable lots, even if the bulk lot standards and the size and the heights are all, all match. So I would like to remove the owner occupancy requirement. Is that a straw poll? That is a straw poll, yes. Should we just go with it? May, 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 I, argue, yes. may, I, may I argue some of this? Okay, so we know that there's a short-term rental uh, legislation currently being discussed up at the legislature that would allow up to 80% of any residential area to be designated as eligible for short-term rentals. And that is intensely concerning because it in no way offers us the protection of our housing stock that we're looking for. And this owner occupancy in light of that potential legislation becomes increasingly important even though it can be somewhat onerous in a few cases where someone wants to live out of state and maintain this house and rent both. Yeah. And I maintain parts that, if that if short-term rentals is the threat, then we should make owner occupancy required in all of our zones for all kinds of housing. Can, can I add a statement on that bill? So that bill creates an opt-in program. And if you opt in, then you have to allow 80, uh, short-term rentals on 80% of the properties that allow residential uses. It's not a requirement for cities oh. to allow short-term rentals on 80%. So, Councilmember Puy. I know. I mean, I've been, you know, moving along uh, like a lot on this issue, and I'm still, you know, uh, I understand the concern, and I brought it up last time. You know, I still believe that there is a concern on, um, on you know, short-term rentals. I also think that maybe there is an, a, a market equ equilibrium there that might happen. Let's say, you know, the the biggest nightmare that you know all of us, you know, think maybe 200 ADUs are trying to get permitted next year, and all of them become. Um, you know, short-term rentals, you know, would eventually, wouldn't that, like, the market take care of that and say, like, no, there is too many of them. We need to, you know, like, mm. you know what I mean? So I, maybe we just need to just uh, remove the requirement uh, and, and, and see how it goes. Um, but I also very concerned about it. Um, I'm very concerned about, you know, where the legislature is going with this. I don't like that bill that is being discussed. I think it's horrendous. And um, 
I am nervous because I don't want to see all the housing, all the ADUs being used by many out-of-state companies that are buying them and putting them in, in, in the market and removing it from housing. So I'm throwing all of these things there uh, because I still don't know what, how to vote. So I think the data out of California, which is the state that has gone the furthest with ADUs, I believe, is showing, someone needs to fact check this, but that most of them are not being used for short, short term rentals and that when you took away the owner occupancy requirement, that's really when the production of ADUs went up a lot because you're now opening it to twice as many people, not just people that live in their house and intend to stay living in their house. You're opening it up to also people who own a house but are renting it out to a family right now and would like to rent that land out to two families. I I get your argument, Mr. Chair, and I understand that. I think for me, again, one of the biggest concerns is um, the the ability to regulate in ways and be able to like not have the short term rental thing happen. And I also don't know, maybe they're not being used for short term rentals in California, but I don't know what the regulation policies for short term rentals is in California. And if they have the ability to regulate short term rentals in a way that we don't have, then that change, that's not comparing apples and oranges. That's fair. And and so, uh, you know, I recognize that in some ways this is. A deterrent to building ADUs, but I think what we're seeing in the few ADU applications over the last few years that we've had is that it is actually owner occupant houses that want to build something within their property again because we that's don't allow that's it. Allowed. That's all that's allowed. That's all that's allowed. But I also just I it goes back to what the intent is and what my intent is and what my intent was it in the beginning of ADUs. Down. I'm not considering ADUs as this entire brand new stock of housing that's going to solve everything. It is another hmm. arsenal, right? It's another tool in the tool bag and it is meant in my mind and when we discuss this original ADU ordinance to create another type of housing stock. And, and the more diversified we can get within our housing stock, the more ability there is for people to hopefully have housing. So for me, at this point, without any actual ability to regulate how this is going and the, this like legislation looming in all these different ways, it's important that that owner-occupant requirement stay there. I, again, I understand your argument. It's just... I came at this five years ago when we first passed this ordinance with a different intent. Okay. And I, I keep that intent there, even though that can change. There's underlying intent is there for me. In that case, I think you should vote to keep the ordinary occupancy quarter. I would like the intent of the ADU ordinance and the result of it to do more than what you're saying you would like it to do. So I'm going to I'm going to ask for a vote on my straw poll to can remove the owner occupancy requirement okay, okay. wait but I, I yeah i want to make a I comment too i want to okay, okay. So i i am very very nervous about saying that that the free market will correct um on issues about um housing because that's how we got into the housing crisis that we're in and uh that's how cities i think that's why cities are are having such a hard time grappling with um short-term rentals um what what my residents are asking for is they're saying i i am a senior i'm on a fixed income i need ability to age in place and supplement my income and i have a yard that i can use to add to the housing crisis or i have young couples that are saying um it would we also want to to add um, we, a unit to our property, and that would help us be able to afford the rising costs of home ownership. Um, and that those are the people that um, I'm trying to, to protect on one side of the spectrum. The other people I'm trying to protect are renters. We have a very limited ability as a city in the state of Utah to protect renters and to ensure that they have decent conditions. One way that we can increase the likelihood that they will have better conditions is that their owner is right there, that the owner of their property is right there and having to share the same space with them. Um, and also ensuring 
And so that's the third group that I'm protecting. And the last one is neighborhoods. We need to have neighborhoods that have a mix of renters and owners. And if we to remove the home uh, owner occupancy requirement, then we incentivize or open up the gate for for um, companies to come and buy up huge sections of neighborhoods to turn all of those houses into rentals and then to turn put ADUs in backyards of all of those houses. That is not what I want to see for Salt Lake City. And that is contrary to the goals of, of our housing plan. And Mr. Chair, I, I, I just want to add to, I agree with Councilmember Fowler and, and Wharton and their comments, but I also believe that uh, you know, having the owner occupied requirement that does give them the now they have they're in the house there they're going to build a, a accessory dwelling unit that that really matches and meets the needs of the neighborhood and their house and if you just have a developer he may just build something that's not really compatible to even that primary residency so I think there's some there's some buy-in with that owner occupancy but I all think the other so pieces of the ordinance so speak to though Mr. Chair but. I so I, I, can we just vote on this one? No, I, I want a, I a friendly. We've all yes. Can I, like I'm gonna like can a friendly be a addition to your to your straw Thanks. poll. You know what I don't want it to happen. So is what happened before, and that's why we're reviewing this. We opened this ADU ordinance. Uh, we opened this idea so that people could do that, and then we didn't have anything for four years. Like oh. nothing significant. And, and the uh, significant number of applications to, you know, to um, to do what we want it to do. So I don't want this again to be next, you know, be here in a couple of years and ask Nick, Nick, how many applications you got? Oh, I just got four. Like that's I don't want that to happen because then we're wasting everybody's time. At the same time, it would be nice to if we go and I understand all the reasons. If we if we keep that owner occupied requirement. I would like to make it a system for the planning division to, to come every year and say, hey, this year we only had 10. And the, the reasons are econom economics uh, or really like it, we're too restrictive. Nobody wants to do it. So maybe we do need to open it up. But it's, it shouldn't be this whole thing about, you know, like this huge thing, two hours of discussion worth of this, but worth of worth of our time, but something for Nick to report to us, and then we can make decisions and adjust these ADU ordinances as, 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 as we go, you know, how society goes and how life goes and what we experience in real life uh, when we get uh, permits and stuff. So my addition to your straw poll, sorry, no, I because guess it's you, not, yeah, yeah, never mind, I guess not Let's that. just. Let's straw poll to that and I'll then go, uh, go back to. Yes, if you would like to remove the owner occupancy requirement. And I would like to do that. Please show your feelings. Oh, no. Two yes being count myself and Councilmember Pui and the rest no. Okay. Um, and I want to do a, a new straw poll. Okay, count, go ahead. A new straw poll is that we do keep that requirement. Um, the owner occupancy requirement in, but within 12 months, we ask the planning division to report on how many ADUs, uh, ADU applications have uh, been applied for and to give us a summary of why we have so many or why we have so little and a few reasons. Uh, it's, it's so, they have an I, I confuse. Have that. Yeah, we have an annual requirement for a review. Okay. If we do, then. But I think maybe the straw poll is that we as a council review this specific, specific piece of policy. I would say based on that. I would, I would like to bump that up to two or three years because you, when one year process is going to be a, not really going to give you that much data points. What so do I would we want to get back wait. from planning? What information? I, if all of these restrictions worked out or not for, for our purposes, like are ADUs being built or are they not? Because we are so restrictive that nobody wants to do it. And therefore, our purpose of having ADUs is no, like, why do we even have an ordinance? I, th I think it would have been great to remove the condition and, and ask and in planning it did it how many problem. of them were actually, you know, owner occupied uh, and which ones weren't. Um, and then we can close it back, uh, you know, if that was the case. Uh, but I, I mean, th that to me would have been where to go. But I, I understand what you propose that straw poll. Can I, I have the votes, can I make so. a couple of comments? So 
That's right. We do have a reporting requirement in our code. The state also actually now requires us to do a state a report to the state as part of our modern income housing plan that's that's required annually. We have to indicate how many owner occupied or not owner occupied um, ADUs we have in the city, whether they're internal or external. So we're already doing this. Um, I would. It's actually fairly cumbersome to do it. <laughs> yeah. So I would. I would prefer not to have to even go dive deeper into those every year. Um, but if we're already, part of the state code requirements, and one of the things that's in this code is aligning that report that the, is in our code with the due date of the state report. So we're only doing one report a year instead of two. Sounds good. Um, so I would, I would hope an that an ordinance that, change that needs to happen. No, it's actually in this proposal. Oh, it is in Great. front of you. Good. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, so are, can we move on to setbacks now? <laughs> okay. This is the fourth of five items. <laughs> setbacks, I think that from my, my analysis of the last discussion, I think we're, most of us are in agreement with what planning proposed on setbacks. The one, and I think Councilman Dugan may have some changes. The one thing I would like to do is on corner yard setbacks, rather than saying if it's a corner yard you have to have 10 feet no matter what because there are some lots the next door to my house is a like 25 foot wide lot if you have 10 feet on one side 10 feet on the other side you have five feet left to build an adu so i would like to remove the 10 foot for corner yard setbacks and change that language to 20 percent of the width of the lot or 10 feet whichever is less so if it's a wider lot, then it may require a 10-foot setback, but that wider lot may, may, would accommodate a 10-foot setback. But if it's a narrower lot, because what we're doing without that is that with a narrower lot, we're saying you, if you're on a corner, you just can't build an ADU. And actually, I think that's where it makes the most sense to build an ADU. Nick. Yeah. <laughs> so I would just want some clarification when you say width. Are you talking from side, from corner side yard to... The other side yard, side yard or are you the talking property line not okay. the depth okay and i i know it gets yeah. to i just wanted to make sure that we're on the same page but i thought yes. that's what you meant but. yes i'd have to really kind of probably draw that out so i could understand that one but i think that what my my concern with is these setbacks we went from 10 yard 10 feet i and we went from 10 feet to three feet and then we have a so a, a step back from that for every feet of above 17 feet. And I think that th three foot setback for a lot of houses on the, on, whether it's on the side or the back is really tight. And so any, any extra foot that you can have on that setback, I think is, is much more valuable. What to I'm proposing is for corner side yards, which means that that's the setback facing the street. So <clears throat> to keep that high means you're pushing it closer to the next door neighbor's house. My proposal is to allow it to come closer to the street oh. so that it's further away from the next door neighbor's house and it's closer to the street. Okay, so that's the that's corner yard setback. Corner yard setback, yeah. We haven't gotten to the other ones okay, yet. Okay, gotcha. Okay. So my proposal is that. Straw poll, thank you. On the corner yards. Councilman gotcha. Walter Moros. Okay, that's seven to zero to ch make that change. Is, it, is that clear what the intent I think, is? I think so. Thank we'll you. figure out how to write it. Okay, so now we're back to the regular setbacks, which is what was proposed was three feet up to 10, depending on the height. So it's a scale as you get closer to the maximum height that we're allowing, you would get up to 10 feet. I propose we keep it at the same as what planning proposed. I, I, I would like to see that extend at, at least to four feet from that first step back before you get to before you go to the other ones. And I don't mind the 17th, 18th, 19th. Okay. But I think we need to have a little bit more of that separation from the, the houses, especially in, the, in this case, reviewing the process, reviewing this again in a few years. But I think that-, that So you'd like to change the yeah. three to four and then add. Yeah. Any other comments to this or- Every we... foot matters in my neighborhood. I'm, I'm down for three. We're ready to vote here. I have a question, sorry, first down. Yes. I, sorry, sorry. Um, it's like making it even more complicated. But does this take into account for any change at all? Like, are we, is it assuming that, that the two houses are exactly the same grade? Because what? For setback? It's still the same. Yeah, well, because well, we're talking about the height. Does that make sense? 
So the, the height, about... it, so depending on the zoning district, the heights can be measured differently in different zones. Okay. In most of the R1 zones, it's, I'm going to probably mix these terms up, but it's basically from what we call established grade. Uh -huh. And established grade is the grade of the property prior to the proposed development activity. Okay. In other zones that aren't single family zones, it's measured from, and I might get either established or finished mixed up <laughs> here, but the intent is uh, the others, it, it's from, um, we, we actually average the grade, okay. right? So it, it's, it's done a little bit differently in like a commercial zone or, or a multifamily zone versus a single family zone. Okay. But in most R1 zones, it's the grade at the time of the development? No, no it's, it's at the time of the last development activity. Oh, okay. So if somebody came in and built a garage and yeah. they're allowed to do some grade changes and they did that, uh -huh. then that establishes the new grade that we measure okay. height if they were okay. to make additional changes. Okay, I'm okay with it. Okay, keep the setbacks as proposed by planning. We have six voting yes, one voting no with that being Councilmember Dugan. We're on to the last one, I, and I hope there's no additionals, but <laughs> um, removing the conditional use requirement. So the planning staff and the planning commission both recommended, forwarded a proposal that we remove the conditional use permit. My understanding is that is the actual complete genesis of this whole time we're reviewing this. Um, and so I would propose that we make it a permitted use. <laughs> I could, do you want me to? I, uh, I, in a, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Council Member Warren. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, okay, so I six, feel like I need to explain because I was the one who was talking about the yes, conditional uses at the last meeting. Um, I think that when we created the ADU ordinance, um, having the conditional use requirement was the right thing to do. I think we learned a lot about how to, how to build ADUs in Salt Lake City and how to do them well um, and but I think now that we have learned that information and we've gathered a lot of data um, that has informed a lot of the decisions we're making today that I feel that these other protections are adequate to um, and I think that the biggest concern one of the biggest um, cost sucks for people was the staff time that going into the conditional use and so i i feel comfortable getting rid of that now um given the information that we learned and given um these addition that have really informed these additional requirements for our city specifically so in in i'm I feel like I am bargaining in good faith because <laughs> um, uh, I do want to solve the problem as well. And so for that reason, I would also um, vote yes. Thank you. Okay, so seven to zero. Thank you. That's the last of the list. Uh, not yet. Damn it. <laughs> I mean, shoot. Sorry. I broke the rules of the quorum. <laughs> There's probably been worse Council things. Councilmember Dugan. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Plenty to, to uh, this is on the height of the ADU. And I want to, to explain uh, a detached garage, its setback and its height requirements uh, on this, and then the change that we've made here to the height of an ADU compared to the primary unit, primary dwelling. Okay, um, so on the second question, are you asking for a comparison of the current ADU requirements to the, okay. Um, so I'll start with the garage. Um, so it is regulated differently depending on the zoning district. In single family zones, um, you can have a height of up to 12 feet for a flat roof, 17 feet for a pitched roof, um, unless your principal structure is taller, in which case you can go up to 75% of the height of the principal structure up to 21 feet. Um, and that setback would be one foot from the side and rear property lines. So a detached garage could go up to uh, 21 feet would be the maximum allowable. Yes, if that were less than 75% of the height of the uh, principal building. Right, and the height of the principal house in the single families is 24 feet, or is that also? That Generally, is, it's right. 
So, so that's where the seven. That also varies by zone. So, for example, it, um, in the R1 zones, it's um, if it's pitched roof, it's 28 feet measured to the peak of the pitch. If it's flat roof, it's 20. Uh, in the SR1A zone, which is mostly the Avenues Capitol Hill area, um, it's 23 feet for a pitched roof, and a flat roof I think is 16 um, or something like that. Um, so. There's, it varies as well, and it also varies in the foothill zones. Okay. So there's, there's a variety of different heights in different zoning districts. Okay. Does that answer the, yeah. the first question? Okay. Um, so on the second question, comparing the current requirements to the new ones, um, in a sense, they're the same. The base height allowance is 17 feet, and then you can go up to 24 feet with an increase in setback. Uh, the difference is how we treat the setback. Um, so under the current requirements, the base setback is four feet from side and rear. And then if you go above 17 feet in building height, then you immediately have to jump up to a 10 foot setback, unless you're abutting an alley, in which case you can keep a four foot setback on that side. Um, and when you compare that to the current requirements, it's a, uh, a ratio of the height. Um, so you can gradually increase the setback as the building height increases rather than jumping immediately to the Increase but, setback. But also the current one, the, the new amendment allows you to go to 24 feet, even if that is higher than your primary dwelling. Yes. So the, the um, ADU could actually be taller than your primary dwelling. Yes. Yeah, so that is another difference. Um, right now, you're limited to the height of the principal dwelling or less. Um, under the current proposal, uh, you would be allowed to go taller. Um, yes. If okay. you were. And that's that's. I'm inclined and in that I would rather look at it that the uh, ADU could not be any higher than the primary dwelling height or yes. I'm a very hard no on that because I think that says any single family, any single level house may not build an ADU above a garage and that cuts out almost all of the historic properties in my district that are alley accessed for which an ADU above a garage is the most logical and efficient mm -hmm. and least impactful for, form of construction. So that may help your district, but it would really, really harm my district. But you couldn't have an ADU above your detached garage if it had a one foot setback, correct? You could not. Nope, you would have to have a 10 foot setback if you're going up to that maximum of 24 and feet. I understand that there's some alleyways, so I can see maybe the exception for an alleyway, but I'm concerned about ADUs without, or houses without alleyways, and having that a, a larger unit behind the house, the primary dwelling unit. And that's my concern of the, the scalability of the, of the size. So. And there may be a way to resolve that concern, but it's not in a relation to the primary dwelling, if you ask me. I have two questions for staff on this. Um, so again, about grade changes, when you're talking about height of the house, um because you know if you have let's say you have a house that's like on the south end of the block in the avenues and then you're building your adu further up and it's up a hill like is it the height do you measure them from the same ground the or? It, it so the height's supposed to follow the contour of the earth in that in, in like the r1 zones and the sr1a zones so there there's a there are uh for principal dwellings huh. There is an ability, so when you have a cross slope, mm -hmm. to allow the downhill side to be slightly taller, right? But for the most part, it, it's supposed to follow the, the slope of the earth. So it does take grade into account? Yes. Okay. And then second question, obviously, this wouldn't allow you to build like a three or four story ADU in your backyard. <laughs> um, and you have your, your little one or two story house. What... If the ADU can be taller than the house, what's the maximum height taller that it could be, like realistically? Well, that's going to depend on the house, right? Because we don't know the height of every single house. But if you're like in a bungalow, the typical height is, you know, 14, 15 feet. Mm -hmm. um, so if you had a large enough property to get to that 24 feet, then I guess it would be nine feet taller than, than a, a bungalow. But that would be like a that would be an example of a significantly higher ADU, right? That would be the most. Yeah, it could go above. Right. Okay. 
All right, I think. So is that a straw poll, Dan? Yes. And the straw poll is? Be that the ADU cannot be any higher than the primary dwelling. Okay. Maximum. <laughs> okay, five to one with five to two. Okay. All right. Are we ready to move on? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, we're going to bump item number 10 to next week, but we are currently on item number nine, which is the rezone at 130 North 2100 West. That one stays. Uh, the local link discussion is not time sensitive, so we'll move that to next week. Thank you, Nick and Michael and Brian. So are we doing nine? We're doing nine. Okay. I'm just giving you a, a forewarning that we're going to bump 10 to next week since that took significantly longer. <laughs> <laughs> we have at the table Brian Fulmer again, Chrissy Gilmore, and Kelsey Lindquist. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a proposal to amend the zoning map for the property at 130 North 2100 West and remove it from the Airport Flight Path Protection Influence Zone B. A hotel is located on the property, and the petitioner's intention is to remodel the hotel for use as permanent supportive housing for older individuals transitioning out of homelessness. The applicant is with us and available to answer council questions, and with that, I'll turn it over to Chrissy. Thank you. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. So as Brian mentioned, this is a request to um, amend the zoning map to remove the property at 130 North 2100 West from the airport flight protection path influence zone B. Um, so if removed from influence zone B, the property would be subject to all zoning regulations in the underlying base zone, the TSA, TSA mixed use employment center trans transition zone. Um, the primary impact is that those uses currently prohibited in the overlay zone would now be allowed um, if, if they are either a permitted or a conditional use in the TSA zone. And this includes multifamily residential. And as mentioned, the petitioner is planning to use the site as permanent supportive housing for those trans transitioning out of homelessness. So this amendment would allow that use. Um, the airport overlay zone B is less restrictive than zone A. So zone A, um, just to kind of go over these, zone A prohibits um, housing and then also prohibits institutional uses such as like rest homes, um, churches, schools. Zone B um, prohibits housing unless it's associated with agriculture. And then it also, it does allow those institutional uses. So that's the biggest difference is that zone B allows those institutional uses while zone A prohibits them. And then zone B allows commercial uses as well. Um, so another difference with the zoning map amendment would be that if it's removed from that overlay zone, it would remove all sound attenuation requirements. So this has been added in as a suggested condition of approval that those, those requirements are still in place through a development agreement. And then I've included this map on the screen that shows the zone B boundary. So zone B is the north side of North Temple, and then zone A comes to the south. Um, you can't really tell from this map, but then as you go to the east across the freeway is zone C, which essentially allows all uses as long as there is proper sound attenuation. Um, next slide, please. So as far as key considerations, I'll just walk through planning staff's um, you know, process of review and mindset as we, as we got to recommend um, approval for this petition. So when reviewing the request, there was a concern regarding equity and supporting um, placing vulnerable populations in an area where we wouldn't otherwise support uh, market rate housing. And in response to those concerns, the applicant provided a noise study which showed that the levels associated with the airport, the noise levels associated with the airport were actually lower than anticipated. And the highest um, noise impacts were actually from the freeway. And while pollution levels are still a concern um, from the freeway, Salt Lake City does allow per, um, permitted multifamily housing just on the other side of the freeway that has the exact same impact. Um, and then in review, we also found that the site was, is in with walking distance um, of bus stops and tracks, a track stop. And then staff also reviewed broader city goals while 
um, analyzing the petition, such as Thriving in Place, the city's recent anti-gentrification and displacement study, which showed that Salt Lake City is severely lacking um, deeply affordable housing and that production of those units should be a primary consideration moving forward. So while equity concerns um, you know, we're brought to the front of our conversation with the noise report and the fact that permitted housing is allowed in similar conditions on the other side of the freeway, as well as that recommended conditional of approvals. Planning staff um, believes that these concerns are mitigated, mitigated in this request. And so next slide, please. And so with that, um, the Planning Commission forwarded a positive recommendation to the City Council that includes that um, suggested condition, condition of approval that I mentioned that has to do with sound attenuation. Um, the applicant has already met those conditions. They're currently remodeling the building, but this would really come into play if the property is ever you know, torn down and rebuilt, or if there's any additions to the structure, this would, these would need to be met. And that concludes my presentation. Um, I do know the applicant is here. If you had questions for them, or I can answer any questions. Council members, any questions before we hear from the applicant? I have one. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I don't have any questions, but I'm just, I love the line that the, the, the noise from the freeway is higher than the noise from the aircraft. Uh, so back to the I-15 expansion. It's T-15 in that area that's causing. I, I know. But we could, but, we could definitely even, reference the refusal from UDOT to put sound barriers out in West Point. Uh, yeah. So, Carol, could we have yeah. to study? Because I, I need it for other things. <laughs> so, so the, the exact point, though, this is 215, and 15 would probably be a little bit louder, maybe. So, so thank you. I appreciate that. I, I have no questions. I, my only question is I, I appreciate that, and I think that the, the request makes sense. And now that the study has been done and we understand that that freeway is a much bigger impact to health, safety, and wellness of people living in that area than the airport is altogether. And I know this is an applicant a uh, uh, property owner initiated application so they can only apply for their own property, but does it make sense for us to just look at a larger area to uh, open up to housing, knowing that the airport actually it doesn't affect that, so maybe that flight path overlay influence zone B is not warranted. And that's a, that's a kind of a separate question, but just like does, mm -hmm. is that worth considering? Um, would, you know, I think we'd have to meet with the airport you know, on a broader basis, yeah. but we did run this by um, the Division of Airports, and they didn't have concerns with this specific request. That said, I think we need to look at the airport master plan build out and see how that looks for for other properties. Okay. And I don't know that I'm saying that's a super high priority. Do it right away, but like if that conversation happens, it seems like this is also the last quasi residential in the area. Everything else is like Northrop Grumman is out there. There's a lot of um, office space and industrial. Yeah. It's all this, the 2200 West stuff is all the stuff that's like ancillary to the airport. So these are the two hotels that were not in use in the area that are now be, being converted to this necessary use. And I would just add, I think it would be challenging if we removed more properties from the overlay without requiring some sort of sound attenuation. Right. So this is nice on a like a case to case basis so that we can ensure that, that there's that's, that's, quality that living standards. That makes sense. Yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, do we Mr. Chair? Yes. Trees are very good for sound attenuation. We you know, I you know, I everybody knows hearing uh, how much I'll talk about trees. Uh, but I wonder if there is a way of encouraging the, you know, the, the, the developer to you know, plant a bunch of trees uh, and try to help uh, break that sound that happens there. I mean, we go there sometimes too, too many times uh, to eat in that area, and, uh, and it is loud. But trees will help a lot. So I would love to, to hear from the applicant and see if they're interested in putting a lot, lot of trees. Great. Any other council member? Questions or thoughts before we let the applicant speak to us? Great. Um, I would like to ask the applicant if they're interested in speaking. If not, you don't have to, but. Carol, did you want to come down? While she's on her way up, I do want to point out a little bit of an elephant in the room. Um, Carol and I have met exhaustively about this. Um, she was unaware of this airport overlay when she purchased it and so we've discussed this this is not something that should be expected regularly out of this council and this airport overlay district should not be taken flippantly um, however the confluence of her willingness to rectify the issues to protect the dignity of people who are living there and to meet of severe current need made it 
a consideration worth having right now. And so Carol, thank you for meeting with me and discussing that for meeting with the other council people and making sure we corrected this as quickly as possible. Yeah, thank you, uh, City Council. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And thank you, Chrissy, for the presentation. And Planning Commission really spent a lot of time reviewing this and thinking about this, I think, in a very thoughtful way, obviously concerned about precedent, um, concerned about the message that it sends about equity in our community. And I think they were exceptionally thoughtful in their review and the depth of the of the study of this, including taking time to go out and be at the site and kind of see what, um, what it's like. I would just like to uh, talk about a couple of the uh, in detail about a, a couple of the sound items that were mentioned. So uh, from the sound study, one of the, one of the interesting things is that the item that produced the most noise um, in close proximity to the building was an automobile speeding by and then a water truck passing by, both of which came in at around 67 decibels. And um, airplanes landing and taking off ranged between uh, about 52 decibels to 60 decibels, so they were less loud than that. And then I-215 generates kind of a continuous noise level of around 72 to 73 decibels um, adjacent to this property. And as uh, Chrissy mentioned, you know, immediately to the east of I-215 and all along North Temple there are multifamily housing developments that are both affordable and market rate. Um, I know as a city, North Temple is a big focus on housing development right now. I think it has exceptional access to transit, um, exceptional access to downtown for people coming from the airport, um, especially if they're coming by transit. It's, um, it's the gateway to the city and, and is quickly becoming the gateway to the city. And I think that the development that goes in there is very important. Um, and from an equity standpoint, to give uh, individuals that are coming out of homelessness, that kind of access to both downtown and to transit is phenomenal. I mean, otherwise we're looking at, you know, locating people further, further south in Murray or, or other parts of the county. And I know that there is a desire to spread um, homeless services throughout, you know, throughout the community so that Salt Lake City isn't bearing the brunt of, of that burden. But for Carroll and, and Switchpoint, there is such an emphasis on this this idea of permanent supportive housing, helping people get back to work, um, back to school, and and locating um, this this property in a place where uh, her clientele will have ready access to these kinds of services, I think is just phenomenal. So we appreciate Planning Commission's recommendation. I'll let Carol correct anything wrong I've said. So, and I'm going to try not to say anything about the ADUs as well because I have lots of thoughts there. So. <laughs> We did not ask no. for that feedback. Um, no, <laughs> but you can I, come I, at seven and yeah. share those thoughts. <laughs> I was asking them all about the ADU I want to build in the marmalade on my property, but it's like, does that work for me? <laughs> Anyways, so I was trying to straw vote you back there. <laughs> uh, no, um, no, I think it's a, a great project. Um, again, when we first looked at the the map, it we thought it was MUEC and there was no overlay on it after having done the first one. You know, this was a, a project that um, was voted upon out of the three um, and received $2 million in, in um, funding for this project. And so, you know, for us, it's the how do we get that quickly done to alleviate some of the burden that's happening right now uh, in overflow. And this population are all individuals who can pay their own rent. And so that's, you know, for us, that's really important that many of them are working uh, still, in, in, even though they're elderly, because they're trying to keep a part-time job. So. That's why we really liked the location of it next to to, to, to the track. So, yeah. Mr. Chair, yeah, I please take my, my encouragement about trees uh, in the in the side. I will plant some trees for you. Okay, thank in you. In fact, you I'm, know, uh, if you would like to sponsor a tree, I would accept. I that. get you a tree. We'll uh, do we'll uh, do a day service. We'll come and out we're, and we're going to do sponsor second, a tree. And the yeah. second part to that is maybe removing some of the grass will be fantastic. Oh, we'll move a lot. Remove a lot of the grass. Yeah, we'll keep a little area um, at the point airport uh we have 37 dogs now out of wow. the 116 residents so we have to keep a little bit of grass for the pp but um other than that we want to get rid of it yeah yeah great and there will be no pool either <laughs> save water <laughs> any other questions from council members thank you i i think that we are up to speed on this um 
We are. Weird question. I don't know if it's allowed. Tell me if it's not. Only if it's not allowed, okay. not related yeah. to ADUs. So, no, it's not an ADU <laughs> question. So my question is, is, is there a way to expedite the permit process so that we can continue work? Because we've done all demolition, which didn't require a permit, but to keep it going, else we're waiting another 30 days. So, so basically, yeah. Sorry, can well, I can, yeah, yeah, I can explain that the, um, what she's asking is that the building permit um, can't move forward until this zone change is approved, and that's what's um, holding up. The, I think I that's think, what you're saying, right? Yeah. That that's what's holding up the I think for permit. state law, the best we can do is we still have to put this through to a uh, public hearing, which is scheduled for... That's February 21st. February 21st, which is not today, but the next time we have a public meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and then our, typically we would wait until the next meeting... I, there has been precedence to suspend the rules and adopt that night, but that would be the soonest we could legally. The question would be, though, is if, if it wasn't approved, we would just run it as a, an extended stay hotel, which it was. So we would need, we would keep working on it and put it back to that existence. So I, I guess. That's a, probably a question for the building services department to, or the, uh, that's probably not a question for us, but somebody hopefully is able to. That would be the condition is because. Either way, we can't leave it half torn down, right? So we would either put it back to an extended stay or say, okay, we were granted it, but. I mean, I'm we're getting into to, a little bit of a weird yeah. conversation, but I think if, to use that if your building April, plans, so kind of in a pinch, right? if your building plans call for, the zone. if you can pull, the, pull a building permit to build an extended stay hotel the same way, and then you just apply for a change of use once you get get the zoning. That seems like a legal and that, process. That's what we're arguing for. It's you know, so it's an existing building. So under, underneath international existing building code, there's basically. I don't think that's a question that we can. I don't. I think that's not. I think that's a administrative question, not a legislative question. So I don't think that we're in our. We're but it's right maybe a, to, maybe a question that that with some support from city council at the building department level could. Could help. Not so. really appropriate for us to okay. take our our yeah. influence and okay. tell the mayor staff what they should or should not do. So that would be that would probably not be super appropriate for us to do. But we can try not to hold up our process. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Chrissy. Thank you. All right. We are skipping item number ten and we're on to item number eleven, which is an informational update on the. State of Utah Fraud Risk Assessment for 2022. And we have Mary Beth Thompson at the table. Hi, Mary Beth. All by myself? I guess so. Um, good evening, Council. And, um, we usually do this with the ACFR, and we forgot to do it with the ACFR, but we are required by law to go through the risk assessment and show you the fraud risk assessment according to the state auditor's office. Um, I'm going to be maybe five minutes, so I'll give you five minutes back. Um, so this is required by law for us to go through and do an analysis on a risk assessment. On page two, you will see we earned 375 of a possible 395. It is very high if you are over 200. So we are well within our um, regulations and requirements pertaining to the fraud risk assessment. Um, you can look down and see all of the um, how we, get, how we receive our points and if it's a yes or a no. And then um, both the CAO, Lisa Schaefer and myself need to sign this and then we transmit this to the state auditor's office when we transmit our ACFR. Less than five minutes. Thank you, Mary Beth. So I'm hearing that we scored 175 points above the minimum. Correct. Which sounds great. Any questions from council members? Thank you for keeping us in such a healthy position. Thank you. Have a good let's, night. Let's assess those risks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We are on item number 12. That is a board appointment. And we are now just a couple minutes ahead of time. Do we have Julie Bjornstad with us? Hi. 
Hi, Julie. So Julie Bjornstad has been appointed by the uh, has been recommended by the mayor to be appointed to the Transportation Advisory Board. Julie, we are excited to meet you. Just give us a few minutes of your time to explain who you are, why you're interested in this board, um, and how you found out about it. Or yeah. Um, so I've been a resident of Salt Lake for the last um, 15 or 16 years, actually in your district, um, Councilmember Mano and uh, have worked professionally as a transportation planner for the last 15 years, um, currently employed by the Wasatch Front Regional Council as a senior transportation planner. Um, and I'm interested in the position, or I guess I heard about it through um, Jonathan Larson, the transportation director. Um, and I'm interested in the position as obviously someone who comes from a transportation planning background, um, but also who thinks that Salt Lake City is the best city in the state um, and quite possibly the nation and would like to keep us mobile as we continue to grow um, and excited about what's been happening recently with the nine line, um, converting the nine south and 11th east to roundabout for instance, um, the conversations we've been having about transit and fares um, and just trying to get our city to be as bike friendly and walk friendly and transit friendly as we can be. Thank you, Julie. Appreciate the introduction. Thank you for your willingness to serve the city. Council members, any questions or comments for Julie? Thank you um, for being willing to volunteer your professional expertise and your time, your personal time. Uh, you are going to be included in our consent agenda this evening to be confirmed. Uh, no news is good news and you can assume that unless told otherwise you have been confirmed and you do not need to attend the meeting but of course you're always welcome to join us all right thank you guys and thank gals you. and other folk <laughs> okay that is all of our agenda items we're on to standing items first is the report of the chair and the vice chair vice chair do you have a report i do not either but i do believe that our executive director cindy gus jensen has many announcements. <laughs> yeah, yes, and I'm looking for them now. Sorry, you guys are faster than I thought. Um, while she's doing that, we do have a closed session scheduled after the announcements, and I think we'll be doing that during dinner break. Okay, I found them. Go ahead, Cindy. All right, so um, you have received a notification. This is in your email. Um, about the um, uh, some pieces of art that are in the city's collection that are proposed uh, to be uh, decommissioned, basically. Um, one is bench sculpture, um, untitled at Bend in the River by Paul Heath, Lindo, Nolan, uh, Louise Freshman, Wayne Geary at Modesto Park, and then the other is um, three concrete furniture structures, sugar house benches. Um, and the recommendations are based on multiple factors, including a lack of structural integrity, repeating and ongoing issues with vandalism, unreasonable cost for repair and safety concerns. So the city does have a system to periodically evaluate artwork and then decommission those that have served their um, life. So. Cindy, what happens when something's decommissioned? Nice. Is it like, I mean, these are cements, like benches, is it like dug out and put in the basement? <laughs> I think it's disposed of. I, I do have some questions too because I got a list of parks, the city, you know, the bond money and all of this. And this is one of the parks, Modesto. So I'm, I would like to learn more about the process on this if there is a way of learning. Hey, I'm, I'm sending you telepathic messages. Do you know anything right now or should we follow up with the council? Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, um, and then we have uh, feedback requested on neighborhood park projects uh, in the $85 million parks, trails, and open space bond. And the uh, council member feedback is welcome. Um, 
And would you like to hold a discussion in future work sessions? Would you like to have small group meetings? Um, they're interested in preparing a process um, and you would need to hold public hearing and approve the use of bonds in a budget opening uh, before the city spend the funds. So do you need direction from us on that? Yes. Would you like to, um, I, how would you like to give your input? I think given that we're talking about the neighborhood parks in each district, we're all going to have different priorities. So I would, I would propose that we start with small group meetings and maybe um, by small, we mean like one person so that we can talk about our specific districts if we're, if we want to, and then we'll have those questions answered and then we can have a larger discussion. I imagine this will be something we would want to have on a work session once we have like actual budget proposals, um, whether that be in a budget amendment or whatever. But okay. I, I, so I, I think we will want those discussions, but right now I, is that okay with council members? about the bond and the neighborhood parks let's start yes. with our okay thank you and then if you do have thoughts um, share them with your liaison or Ben in our office so that they can give the administration a heads up about what you're thinking so far um, then we have been invited as a courtesy by the administration to provide some feedback for their internal budget review committee process. Um, they have a matri matrix of um, things from the mayor that they will be uh, looking at as they evaluate the internal budget um, requests from the departments. And so uh, we were asked to coordinate with the council on uh, finding some possible uh, feedback from the from the city council. We. Our staff did a quick list based on your feedback um, at the retreat, even though the retreat wasn't designed to come to any conclusion. Um, and then also just based on what you um, generally talk about. So the list that uh, is, is just rough, but we came up with is um, uh, equity, stabilizing and optimizing the response models. So there's been some talk about is it time to evaluate those yet or is it time to get them stabilized and um, that type of thing and this was stabilizing and optimizing was the suggestion um, then uh, in general homelessness uh, maintenance of public spaces transit and transportation land use and development affordable housing business support slash economic development, and then overall emphasize the stability of current programs um, over the idea of creating new programs. So stability uh, was an ongoing theme throughout those. Um, this would just be feedback um, that was shared with the administration, and then they would decide um, how to consider it in their process. And Cindy, my understanding is they need this feedback by Thursday, which is why we're doing it as an announcement today rather than a longer discussion. So it's not like you're going to be held to this. This is like, did we capture? Um, and what we could do is um, you all, I think, have a copy of the announcements, I hope. And maybe what you could do is um, give, if you don't, we'll get that to you. Okay, we will get you those. Then you can get your feedback to um, the chair, vice chair, or um, one of us, okay, um, before Thursday. And then um, next item is uh, we need your help because we need a council representative to the Utah League of Cities and Towns Legislative Policy uh, committee right now uh, we're able to fill uh, two slots one of them is um, filled with former chair uh, Dan Dugan and Amy Councilmember Fowler vice chair of RDA has filled the other one uh, her work situation is changing and it's difficult for her to make the meetings and so she wanted to see if anyone else could fill in um, the chair and vice chair were asking, uh, and and also Councilmember Fowler recommended um, Councilmember Petro. 
in that slot, and she was interested in that. Yeah, I think Council Member Pete Treshler is interested in the in the place, and I'm okay with that. That okay? Okay. Is that okay, with everyone? Yep. Okay. All right, and then. Um, uh, city's grant application and process. Um, ooh, oh, okay. Now, yeah. You would you? Okay. Okay. So oh, we. This is questions. following up on several discussions we've had recently about how, um, what level of information and oversight we want on the grants that the city is applying for. So there are a batch of them on tonight's agenda. Those, since they're already scheduled, we're planning to move along the same the traditional process that we've been doing uh, in terms of agenda uh, uh, consent agenda etc the discussion is whether or not we want to amend that process for times for instance when FTEs are being added by a grant do we want to before putting it on for public comment have a work session or things like that and so I think the discussion is what's the best process we're doing that um, and is that something we want to delegate to council staff to say this may be something of council member interest let's schedule that for work session and if they in their judgment don't think that it's something that we would be opposed to then do the same process that we've always been doing of course we still have the information we can look through it. and if any council member individually says I would like to pull that one and put it on a work session, then they can reach out to chair, vice chair, or staff. Does that sound like an okay process? Okay. So, so council staff, please use your judgment to say if you think that we, we as the council would be interested in having that on a work session, then we'll schedule that. And if any individual council members want something to be work session, let staff or chair, vice chair know. Okay, so not a subcommittee approach, just a staff, oh. start with staff, right? Is that okay? Or the other option was to form a, like, formulate a subcommittee to review them all? If I can, I think I've mentioned this the other day. Sylvia does a great job with the staff reports, and I think if that's okay with staff to say this includes an FTE, we know that the council is going to want to hear this, or this includes ongoing costs after three years. Okay. All right. So, and what we'll do is come back to you with what we think you've told us about criteria. Chris has some. Chris, uh, just, Councilman Wharton. I, I don't feel that I need like a report for each grant. Like if there's a batch of grants, can we just have like a table of all the grants? Because I, I don't want the packets to be longer. Um, so you... So I would rather have, like... You would rather stick closer to the process we have now? Well, no, what I'm saying is if we're going to add information to the packets, like, I would like it to be extremely concise. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Very I, good. I also <laughs> resonate with that. Yeah, I mean, I love the packets. I love having all the information there, but it's just, it's sometimes it's unmanageable. Yeah. So, okay, all right. And then one thing in this week's that will be moving forward in the regular way, there was a request from Chair Vice Chair to take a look and just get you guys more information on the one. I think it was number seven that is a, a, a grand application to add some. It's six. Six. Okay. Uh, v. Uh, possibility of charging stations at affordable housing and possibly vehicle not clear whether that would be um, a city administrative effort or whether that would be in in collaboration with uh, the the organization that manages the housing so we'll just ask that question and come back to you with an answer but there was no interest in holding it up it was just a piece of request for info okay that's it. Good. Is that last announcement? Okay, we have a closed session. I understand that it is for discussing reasonably, pending a reasonably imminent litigation, purchase, exchange, release of real property, and attorney client matters. Did we catch everything, Katie? Mr. Mr. Chair, I move that we go into closed session for purposes of uh, imminent litigation, 
real property acquisition or disposition and attorney client matters. A second. Second. Council Member oh. Fowler made a motion and it was seconded by Council Member Wharton. Any discussion? Okay, I'll call for a vote. Councilman Dugan? Yes. Uh, Councilman Valdemoros? Yes. Councilman Petro? Yes. Councilman Wharton? Yes. Councilman Fowler? Yes. Councilman Pui? Yes. And I'm a yes. That passes seven to zero. I, is dinner here? No. Probably. So let's grab dinner and then discuss while we're eating. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Oh, and we are not coming back to work session. We will go directly into formal meeting afterwards for the public's understanding. Thank you.